Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Good late afternoon. Uh, let me call to order the regular City Council meeting for the City of St. Helena for September 26, 2017. Uh, Mr. Ellsworth, would you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Jaffopoulos, the roll call, please. Pronunciation changes every week. Well, sooner or later we'll get close. <laughs> Mayor Galbraith. Here. Vice Mayor White. Here. Council Doreen. Here. Ellsworth. Here. Coverstein. Here. All right, the next item is public forum. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak with respect to matters of municipal concern not on our agenda and public comment is limited to three minutes. Does anybody wish to speak at public forum? All right. Next we go to, oh, you, there are some. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, not all at once. Okay. Oh, Mr. Okay. I'll be very brief. Matthew Heil, 51 Summit Road, Malvern, Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, I flew all the way out here. Well, for a couple of reasons, but one of them was to support the local city council, and uh, in particular, Mayor Galbraith. I think he, we all owe him a debt of gratitude for his service to this city, for everything he has done for the past decade plus, for everything he has done for all of us, for each one of us, myself, my family, my extended family, my nephews, my nieces, my aunts, my uncles. All of us in this community, thank you for your service. Mayor Galbraith. Thank you. Any further public comment? Thank you. Hello, uh, Mike Qualia, representing my father, Raymond Qualia at 1112 Pratt Avenue. Um, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Doring, Mr. White, uh, for your assistance on our parking issue over there with the vineyard. Um, we have some permanent signs in now, and it appears to be rectified. It was a successful harvest with uh, little to no stress. So thank you very much. Good. Uh, my next question is, um, who is responsible for enforcing compliance with use permits? Um, so specifically, my question is, is Behringer's allegedly has a use permit uh, supposedly it's around and I've heard numbers of anywhere from 12 to 20 truck diesel trucks per day on Pratt Avenue um, so now with them allowing Los Alcobas to utilize their property as a warehouse um, that has significantly increased truck traffic so di specifically diesel truck traffic so is it incumbent upon me as a private citizen to sit out there and take pictures and uh, sit in my sit in my lawn chair, or how do I rectify or to ensure that someone is compliant with the use permit that you guys have authorized? So that's kind of what I'm looking at. Um, there is definitely way more than the 20 trucks during harvest. Um, I know Mr. House said there was no cumulative impact to the project over there at Behringer. However, now we have cement trucks. Now we have you know, you know they're bringing in tanks understanding their can you know their new configuration over there however it is increasing traffic so there is a cumulative in, um, impact over there regardless whether someone wants to believe it or not it's more than just a design review so uh that's pretty much my question all right so code enforcement in saint helena is uh, complaint driven uh, and my suggestion is that you uh, prepare a complaint, file it with the city, uh, and then the uh, code enforcement off the code enforcement officer, I believe, is the uh, planning director, and he will take a look at it. Okay, thank you. And if I'm wrong about this, the city manager is certainly free to correct me. All right. Is that accurate? Yeah. Thank you. Good. Any further public comment? Uh, Suzanne Ortega. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure this is the uh, appropriate time to bring this up, but it's regarding the Elm Tree Tunnel. Yeah, we're going to we're going to have public comment when Caltrans uh, speaks to that. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an agendized item, okay. so if you could hold sure. on that, we'll get back to you. Thank you. Very good. Any other uh, public comment? All right, I'll close public comment. Uh, let me just comment that we uh, met at, in closed session uh, before our open session, uh, and uh, there was no reportable action. 
So that takes us to reports by staff and city council. Uh, let me begin with the city manager. No report tonight. Uh, city attorney. Uh, no report of action. I just would add to uh, what Your Honor said um, that the uh, closed session was with respect to those items uh, that were on the posted agenda for this afternoon's special meeting uh, over at City Hall. And there were two items that were conducted on the posted agenda. All right. I'll be a little more discursive next time. Uh, Ms. Mitz. Thank you. There is no nothing new and exciting in the finance world. Numbers have not changed. Um, so I thought I'd at least give an update on the Harvest Festival since Andre is not here this week. He's at a convention. So the St. Helena Harvest Festival is on Saturday, October 21st, and it's at Oak Street in Adams, and the fun run will start at 8 in the morning, the pet parade at 9.30, followed by the Harvest Festival from 11 to 4. All right. Uh, City Clerk, getting out of that one cheaply. <laughs> I just want to announce to the Mayor, City Council, and the public that there is an opening on the Parks and Recreation Committee. So, City Clerk's Office taking applications. All right. Uh, Ms. Smithies? Nothing to report. All right. Anybody else from uh, senior staff? No? Okay. Will anybody be reporting on the coastal cleanup? I apologize on that one. Then. That would be great. If, a little bit, and I can add to it if you if you need me to. <laughs> we had a great turnout um, last week for the Coastal Cleanup Day. Um, we had about 35 volunteers, or 40, and um, collected over 400 uh, pounds of trash um, from our local creeks. And um, I believe Paul Councilmember Doring was there, and um, two uh, city staff members, and um, the rest were volunteers from the community. And we're looking forward to a, a, even a greater um, success next year. It seemed like we got the momentum going last year. We had one staff member, and he did it all on his own. So it was a vast improvement from a year ago. Yes, and thank you to Chrissy Cook and Tobias Barr for doing a great job of presenting information, organizing the event, making it fun. Uh, and I think everybody enjoyed uh, the community service work, and it, it was nice to see the turnout compared to last year. It was a much stronger turnout. A lot of scouts participated along with their parents. Uh, so it was great. I, I saw a lot of stuff in that river, and it's kind of interesting to see the underbelly of uh, St. Helena under some of the bridges. I never thought I'd end up under a bridge, but I did <laughs> on Saturday. And so quite interesting. We, we did gather quite a bit of interesting uh, recyclable material and other materials. So uh, thank you to the community for showing up, and hopefully we can even do better next year. Thanks. All right. Uh, members of the council, do you have anything else? Mr. Doyle? Thank you. Mr. Wine? Ms. Comerstein, Mr. Ellsworth. Uh, on, uh, yesterday, I went down to Mare Island and visited a, uh, a factory that's going to be producing homes, uh, off-site built homes that um, can be brought into communities to provide housing um, at a lower cost and faster. It was pretty inspiring. Um, this was the the factory that used to be Blue Homes, now it's going to be something else. There's a number of different companies like this that are now starting to look at a, this way of providing housing. I thought it was interesting. It could be one component in a larger housing strategy. Um, and so it, it inspired me to just bring up that I think moving forward in, into looking into some kind of a housing subcommittee or a housing ad hoc committee uh, would be a great thing to start doing, to start thinking about how we provide workforce housing, senior housing, firefighter housing, um, and really start looking at how we implement that into the community. So it was a good tour yesterday and, uh, and uh, something good to think about. All right. Uh, I, too, want to compliment everybody for their participation in Coastal Cleanup Day. Very nice write-up in the paper as well. Uh, the only other matter on my mind is that uh, I took advantage on September 20 of going up to Calistoga the mayor there was conducting a community forum. I wanted to see how he undertook to conduct it. Uh, it was topic specific. It was uh, uh, with respect to a joint powers agree ag agreement uh, uh, between uh, the county and the city of Calistoga dealing with the uh, Napa County Fairgrounds up there. Uh, uh, but uh, it was instructive to me, and I've been in conversation with the city manager, and I'll bring an item uh, to council uh, next 
time, I hope, uh, and invite council discussion as to how uh, we should uh, uh, perhaps run community forums that are topic specific, uh, perhaps with one other council member present uh, and, uh, and and uh, and uh, city staff with expertise if appropriate. But uh, my thought would be it should be topical, uh, and uh, we might try and organize uh, these at the rate of once a month, or perhaps a little bit longer than once a month as we go forward in the next. Uh, few months here. So in any event, this can be subject to further discussion uh, next time. Uh, so uh, that uh, would take us to uh, a, the staff briefing, uh, uh, water update. Uh, Ms. Toole. And what is that badge? Oh, right here? Yes. It's a brooch. Oh, it's a brooch. Okay. It's <laughs> my grandmother's. <laughs> I thought it was a code enforcement badge. <laughs> no. Water's are. <laughs> no longer doing code enforcement for water. I um, am in a, in a different position. Um, so, But I am still doing water updates. We'll wait for the PowerPoint to load. So um, while that's loading, I'm going to give you an update on um, how the rebate programs are going for water conservation and just provide uh, some additional information. <laughs> okay. So I'll just go ahead and get started, Cindy. If it comes up, then we'll connect with the PowerPoint. So just some statistics on the rebate programs for water conservation. We are currently still offering rebates, and we do have flyers available. They are at that back table. Um, we're offering numerous rebates. Um, they are range from toilets to weather-based irrigation controllers to cash for grass, and there's about four other different types. This flyer was built, mailed to all utility customers about 14 months ago. And so everyone should have the information. If not, it is available online. Uh, we have received just over 37 applications, and we have approved 35 rebates. So that totals over $13,000 in water conservation rebates, representing over $40,000 in work in this community. Um, we have removed almost 11,000 square feet of turf grass on 11 separate properties. We're, we have replaced nine clothes washers, three recirculating hot water pumps, 13 toilets, and three weather-based irrigation controllers in the time since the program was revamped. Um, I do have some before and after pictures that I will just go ahead and pass around. Maybe. Oh, you guys have copies? Yeah, we do. Okay. It won't be very effective from here, but these are cash for grass. These are, oh, awesome. Thank you. So th these are local houses. So these are customers that have ripped out their grass and replaced them through the rebate program with some pretty stunning results. So talking about water production, um, per state regulations, we are still comparing to the baseline year of 2013. So you can see that line in orange is where we are today. Our water use is a bit higher than it has been the last three years, but we still are kind of floating below that 2013 level. And here is an updated slide. Um, the state required reporting in June of 2015, and these are the percent reductions compared to that base year of 2013. So um, last year we did drought toolkits, and this year we're doing something a little bit different. We are focusing on outreach to the elementary school. So I have spoken with the principal, and we are going to give a water savings bank, which has educational materials, to every third, fourth, and fifth grader. And then the following year we're going to target the third grader. So every third grader will be getting information about water conservation. 
And then for, we also have stickers and tattoos. There's a toothbrush in there that says, you know, turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth. We're still offering toilet leak dye tabs. I've just ordered more hose nozzles because that seems to be the thing that everyone's asking for. And um, a new item, glass water bottles made in the USA um, that will be given away at the Harvest Festival. And I do have one for every council member. So if members of the community would like a free glass water bottle, they will be available at the Harvest Festival. And the reason why we're doing this is for every um, reusable water bottle you use, it's about twice the water that's saved versus a disposable plastic bottle. So this is also about getting people talking about water conservation, keeping it in the forefront, and just getting people excited to reuse and reduce their water consumption. So I'm also going to plug the Harvest Festival. April did a great job earlier today, but we will have a booth for water conservation, giving away some water savings banks for children, coloring books, and then the glass water bottles. Anna, are there any questions? I have more of a comment. Um, there is a gentleman in the community that um, I've met with and Councilman... Uh, Ellsworth has met with, and he's trying to develop a gray water system to capture certain water from your homes and use it for irrigation purposes, which and I, uh, which would do a lot to keep some water out of our wastewater system. Um, he contacted me a little bit dismayed that the permit costs for this system he thought were kind of high, and I forwarded the information to Erica and Tobias, and I did hear back from Tobias today about what the basis is for that. But the purpose of my comment is to ask uh, that we maybe set aside some time to meet with this gentleman. It's, it's not water conservation per se, the way you've been pursuing it, but it might be a worthwhile uh, project to promote or for the city to promote if we find it actually has some benefits uh, to our wastewater system. So you have the contact information and um, I'd suggest we look into it. Might not be worth it, but it seems like an interesting idea. Very good. Any further questions from Council? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. That then takes us to our consent calendar. I think. All right. And, oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, I may be the I may be the first one to break one. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, and <clears throat> my. Uh, understanding going in is that 7.3, 7.4, and 7.5 are going to be pulled and are pulled. And so uh, uh, I would seek approval by council of consent item 7.1, consideration of proposed approval of resolution approving a memorandum of understanding between the St. Helena School District and St. Helena Recreation Department to provide services for an after-school enrichment program for the primary and elementary schools. And 7.2 is consideration of proposed approval of a resolution approving temporary closure of Oak Avenue, Adam Street, Tainer, uh, for the Hometown uh, Harvest Festival. Move yeah. approval. Second. Councilmember Doring? Yes. Vice Mayor White? Yes. Councilmember Ellsworth? Yes. Coberstein? Yes. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. So that would take us to 7.3, okay. and this is consideration and proposed adoption of a resolution approving the road maintenance and rehabilitation account project list that says fiscal year 2017-2018. Uh, and uh, for that one, let me turn to Ms. Smithies. Thank you. Um, this is a, a new measure. It was brought in um, about earlier this year, and was we approved a budget line in our operations budget um, that was passed in May um, that, that would take an account that approximately a, a revenue of 40000 revenue stream of 40000 to come in um, sometime this year, about mid-January. Um, during that process, um, from then till now, the state's been working on guidelines for how to implement the, um, the Road Accountability Act. 
and it would include an approved list, a yearly list by your local council or supervisors to um, approve a, a list of pro street projects to use for those funds. Uh, it doesn't limit you to those street projects. It just it gives the, uh, the state an idea of what projects you're bringing forward that year, that you'll be hopefully finishing a section, either design or construction on those projects within that fiscal year. We're only looking at $40,000 this year, and we have to submit a list by October 16th to be eligible to receive those funds in January. So um, we do have an emergency project being brought up later in council tonight for Oak Street drainage repairs um, this bill allows you to use those kind of funds for those kind of repairs so my my first thought was using that project since it's supposed to be only about 65,000 estimate but we're not sure um, the extent of the damages to that project so I thought that would be a good project and the other one was was brought up in 2015 um, which was Railroad Avenue and it was to either do a surface treatment of a microsurface um, and or a small overlay on the the, uh, the distance between Fulton Lane and Hunt Avenue and we already got a grant to do the the curb ramps on that project which you have to do if you do a microsurface and overlay so that's already a $45,000 grant going towards that project that would allow us just to have the paving money, which that project would be estimated between 175 to $200,000 to complete. So if we didn't need the funds from Oak Street, um, we could use the $40,000 on that project. Not saying the railroad would move forward this year because we are also working on an update to our Street Saver software um, inspections. Um, every two years we do a, um, an inspection of our city streets to see where the latest um, summary is um, I was hoping to bring that back to council in uh, December or January the consultant that's choose by the Metropolitan Transportation Committee um, selected a consultant who's already started the inspection process and we'll be working with him closely on bringing back a comprehensive list and strategy moving forward on what streets for the next five years with the measure T funds and the maintenance of effort of, of um, we're looking at $1.1 $1 .1 million starting in fiscal year 18-19 um, um, to start really doing some road improvements. So we need to have a game plan going forward. So hopefully January we can have a, a list of streets, a presentation to you on what streets will move forward in the next five years and get council's buy-in on that at, at that point and potentially maybe some more um, um, public outreach, community outreach on that effort so there's transparency in the process. And... Um, so that's right. where we are at this point. But that's next year. Right now, it's just a couple of streets. Right. We're getting 40 grand. Right, because I think there was council discussion previously that at least certain members of the council, including the mayor, had a strong interest in moving forward with uh, repaving uh, Kennedy Court, La Quinta, and El Benita, Correct. which are badly in need of it. I Correct. Both public health and public safety issues up there. So nothing here is going to preclude us from putting that into the budget in 2018-2019. Correct, and and I was just doing some numbers because this was brought up before us um, a couple of days ago. That project, without any utility work, that hopefully we don't need any utility work um, in those areas, the paving alone and the curb ramps that we'll have to upgrade during that project. If we're talking to El Bonita, to Quinta Way, and Kennedy Court, it'd be about a six hundred thousand dollar project. Yeah, I'm so sure. forty thousand won't get us there today, but um, it gives us something to think about. Right in the, the following years. So what we're, what we're trying to do here today is just get something in place so that uh, we're in line to receive these uh, SB1 funds. And it does not preclude us to bring a different project in forward in, in this fiscal year. Um, it's just they need something as far as their accounting procedures and that the file, close of the fiscal year, we update them on what we actually did in 1718. All right, very good. Uh, I, I had a question. So in terms of timeline for the for the uh, Albanita Kennedy Court area, what what is a sort of proposed starting date on that? To there isn't one at this point. Um, I do know in our street our, our software program that lays out streets. You, you do like there's there's I'll bring that back to council in December January. Just looking at our budget now, a couple of the street sections were slated for 2019. Another couple of sections were in 2000. There's a whole comprehensive look at the software that you do um, modeling, and um, you, you have to look at all the streets it shows. I have a map up here, but it, um, it's not appropriate at this meeting. But it shows the network, and you might have a software program that's, that that tells you, you need to do these five streets, but they might be scattered throughout the city. So you need to look at multiple years and see what makes sense. You know, if there's five street sections within two years, you're going to want to focus on that area of town and get that done. Um, it, is there a way, I know that we, we've talked about not wanting to do things twice and do things over, but is there a way to do a temporary surface in that area that would be not 
cost prohibitive, but something that would get them through the next couple of years to till we get to that full scale? It wouldn't be recommended, but, but if, if we're talking, you know, <laughs> we're kind of getting the weeds here on that. Sorry, one, sorry. I, okay. I, can, I can check in with you. And, what, would, what would be great is if um, we didn't have to do as much repair as we do in our later item on here, the Oak Street repairs, but um, if, if there's cost savings, maybe we can do a small project and start design on the bigger projects such as um, Kennedy Court and the other areas of town. But um, All right. Any other initial questions? Uh, is there any, does any? Aren't some of the curb ramps already done on uh, railroad? I thought they did them at Fulton, didn't they? We're, we're doing that project right now. It's in design. Oh, I saw somebody out there working like a month ago, changing ramps right by the teen center. Right by the teen center. There is one on that side done, and there's one at um, the one actually already at uh, Adams and Railroad um, needs to be replaced. <coughs> Um, but the one at the teen center, you're correct, that one was done. But the other ones aren't done. There's about six or seven of them. Right. All right. Does anybody wish to speak at public hearing with respect to this? Hello. My name is uh, Luis Hurtado. I live at 1580 Kennedy Court um, down in El Bonita at the end, uh, La Quinta Way. Kennedy Court's the Lugo Park subdivision. I'm one of the original um, uh, homeowners. Homeowners there. Uh, it was 1972, and um, I just came to uh, let you folks know that we really need to get these streets fixed. It, it's uh, I think it should be prioritized because uh, they are in very very sad condition. There's a lot of potholes now. Uh, when wind whips through there, you get a bunch of dust devils. You get you can't open your windows. Uh, have let fresh air in because of a car or a truck. UPS or FedEx go by there. It's a mess. And I just uh, want you to really uh, consider fixing uh, these streets uh, and put it uh, at the top on there. It, it's I feel I always knew Charter Oak was like the worst one. That got fixed. It's beautiful. Let's do it to our streets. That's the next one. And I just. Um, just here just saying that uh, it's in dire straits. It, it is a safety issue. There, uh, If you happen to trip over a pothole or something, I mean, you get pretty scraped. And, and um, there's you have children out there playing, which they really can't play anymore because the uh, streets are, you can't do anything out there. So just um, just really consider it. And um, I hopefully it'll get done soon, as soon as, soon, as soon as possible. Just yep. prioritize okay. it. Thank you. Good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yep. Thank you. Yes, any? Good evening, Eduardo Gutierrez, 1540 Kennedy Court. Um, the, we all got together at Kennedy Court and La Quinta, the family. We call it a family because we all helped each other build our houses back in the 70s. And our home is deteriorating. The streets are horrible. I made a short film with pictures from the street so you guys can take a look at them. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of loose gravel. Right. I went up there by bicycle maybe two weeks ago. Surprised you didn't fall. Those chunks were I, I had thicker tires. <laughs> <laughs> we have since the last time we came, there was a couple of injuries to some of the kids that live there. You'll see pictures of what happened. Um, hopefully, we can get this resolved soon. That's right in front of my house. Yeah, it's... There was like some kind of fabric from the last time it was repaired. Last time was probably an inch. So then we got more right here. When we were kids, we used to love playing there. But now our kids, no, they don't go there. They're afraid. One of the little boys was playing basketball and he slipped and he scraped his arm. And another boy was playing basketball. When he jumped up, a rock punctured his shoe through the sole and got stuck in his foot and got infected. There's pictures right here. Oh, dear me. And 
mind this. This is the boy that got the rock stuck in his shoe, in his foot. It went through the soul. So we come and ask you to please fix our streets. We'd really, really appreciate it. And if it can be done soon. Yes, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Thank All you. Right. Good evening. My name is Rosa Segura, and I live at 1363 Albanita Court. Grew up on Kennedy Court, and I appreciate what Councilmember Ellsworth said. You know about temporary fixes. Please don't. If you're going to do the full job, do it. Um, a lot of those quicker fixers have been done. Uh, come the rains, they're gone, and they went your money. So. You know, be very careful. Be fiscally responsible as to what you're going to do. Um, I didn't bring any film, but uh, my court on El Bonita has the same issues and the same problems. Um, and now we get more kids with on bikes on our court. They come from Magnolia Oaks. So, yeah, you know, if if you can do it, even if you start with Kennedy Court and go down this way, but do it all at once. Um, I'm beginning to feel like the orphan child that nobody likes. You know, we're part of your city. We're part of town. We, and so we've been made a lot of promises in the past that that it's going to be fixed. That you know we can't do it because Magnolia Oaks is going up, and and as soon as that and construction is done, we're going to work on your streets. So, yeah, if you're going to make the expense and the effort, please do it and. We don't want any more children injured, uh, any kind of children. And if you haven't had a chance to go by El Bonita, all those streets go, and you'd appreciate what we're talking about. Right. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank any, you. Thank you. Any further public comment on this item? Yes, please. So my name is Jose Hernandez. I live in Napa, 2591 Harvest Lane. I have family up here. I have friends up here. I just want to share something with you because we have the same dilemma in, in, in our city as well. But two visits ago, I drove down Candy Court, again, because I have family and friends there. Upon leaving, there's so much gravel, I have a cracked windshield. I'm grateful I have auto insurance, but it's still going to cost me $250. It's not necessary. I mean, I think you want people to come up here, spend their money. I know I do when I come up here. But it's just a, something to consider. I mean, you do have neighbors who love St. Helena. And we want to be part of your community, extended family, right? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that, that street is pathetic. And I think some of you have seen it. And to start talking about 18... You know, 2018, 2019, that's all really honky-dory. But how, how pathetic is it going to be in that time frame? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Any further public comment? All right, I'll close public comment. Uh, any further council discussion? You know, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here that we should not uh, consider this matter tonight and that we go back to the drawing board. I think that this is a public safety issue. It's something that has to happen in this fiscal year. Uh, even if we did a phase project where we started in, into the depth of Kennedy Court and finished half of it with half the funds we have and then moved towards um, Main Street to uh, El Bonita, I just think that this is a project that cannot wait another year because when we're saying put this into fiscal year uh, 2018 this won't get built or, or done until uh, 2019 uh, I was under the impression that we would be having a project this year that we can start in, in in the spring and finish in the summer and that this one to me is the most urgent urgent project uh, much more urgent frankly than than Railroad Avenue and much more prudent in terms of uh, use of our funds if we are uh, investigating um, our our assets and potentially doing a, a redevelopment of the teen center uh, property we would want we would not want to spend money on an overlay and then have that that uh, street uh, devalued immediately with potential construction de redevelopment et cetera at city hall teen center or that whole area of railroad avenue uh, 
the, the thing that irritates me, and it has nothing to do with current city staff or current management or, or current city council, is, is this. Um, certain projects get on lists and certain projects don't get on lists. And I know that this project has been waiting for 20 years, and these folks have been patient for 20 years or more. And the fact that they're here now telling us a story, and I've been out there, it's dirt, it's rocks, it's unacceptable, and we cannot wait any longer. So I, 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 I want us to explore what the downside is, being fiscally responsible, not certainly not losing any opportunity that we have with the state, but at least looking at a phased approach where we can at least dre address some of the major issues. And you know, the worst the, the worst parts are in Kennedy Court, frankly, and La Quinta. Could we at least reevaluate the situation and say, look, let's start there and move out with with the. I believe we set aside two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I think the staff proposed that in our current budget, and we, our council. Uh, unanimously approved that expenditure I'd like to see that money spent on this project in this fiscal year and I think it's urgent and um, until I understand otherwise what the downside is uh, that's what I'm urging our council to do well you know I certainly agree we need to move forward on on uh, Kennedy Court La Quinta El Benita uh, that's why I raised it at the very beginning the precise issue before us is what do we need to do tonight to simply make sure we don't lose the SB1 funds? Nothing. It's just making, bringing some street list forward to the All state. Right. So is, is there any reason not to bring forward uh, Kennedy Court, for example? No, we could put that on the list. All right. Well, that would be, I think that would be the sense of the, the council to put that on the list. You want all three or just one? Can we or? comment? Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I mean, I'm just trying to be following the 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 um, spirit of of the bill and and trying to make reasonable what we're going to complete this year. Yes, uh, I understand that, uh, and uh, uh, it, it, it strikes me that just Kennedy Court is going to cost more than the forty thousand dollars, right? Correct. So, if we put just Kennedy Court on the list for purposes of SB1 and then rethink how it is we're going to deal with the rest of this hopefully this year it seems to me that we've solved the SB1 problem your decision all right mayor if I may um, one another option for the council would be to continue this item to the next meeting and for the staff to essentially marry the focus on SB1 and the com compliance that's required there with an outline of pr prospective projects for the current fiscal year. So this would be, these are projects that would be um, moving to construction in the spring of 2018. Uh, we are intending to bring you back a more comprehensive list, essentially a five-year CIP. But I think there may be value in continuing this, updating our list for SB1. If we bring this back to you on October 12th, we'll still be compliant, I think, with the timeline related to the state. But then give you some framework for the limited funds that we have available this year. The good news is we do have sizable increases in uh, dedicated transportation funding for the next 25 years. So fast forward 15, 20 years, a lot of these streets will be in pristine condition. But uh, the work we're bringing you uh, later this year will be a comprehensive look over the next five years. That's about a $9 million price tag. But I think if we can isolate uh, the work this year, we can work at identifying solutions that start the process related to this particular neighborhood. All right, I see in the staff report that the deadline seems to be October 16th. So we have a meeting before then. That makes a lot of sense to me. Is it, is it the council's? Uh, recommendation to accept the, the continuance on this item to our next yeah. meeting. Could we discuss this a little more? Sure. Okay. Um, I, I support uh, everything Councilman Doring said. I, I also noted that these funds are really for deferred maintenance projects. And if anything's a deferred maintenance project, this is <laughs> it. And uh, I totally agree that it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend money putting an overlay on railroad. Uh, I, I wouldn't even put it on the list myself. We may have construction there um, that's going to cause it to be a waste of money. The third thing I want us to think about is I'd, I'd like us to take a look at our impact fee accounts. Um, I looked at them uh, because this traffic impact account we have has a lot of money in it has roughly $2 million sitting in it. 
um, basically idle cash. And when you look at the project list that's in there, it is principally bicycle lanes. Now, I have no, nothing against people who ride bicycles, but I think it is, I, I think the consultant called it a nuanced approach to use so much money um, for that, but it was okay. But I think we ought to be at least using an equal amount of it for roads because um, this would be money for things like South Crane and uh, those streets, and it seems to just be frozen uh, in our impact fee account based on, I would say, a general plan that we have not yet adopted. So I wholeheartedly <coughs> support uh, tabling this, bringing it back uh, at the next meeting. I think Kennedy Court should be on the list. And I, I would like the staff to figure out if there's anything else we can do uh, to cover the issue at the intersection where the drainage is. Um, Mitchell, yep. the initial the initial funds that we are going to spend because we may have some other <laughs> pot of money reserves or whatever that could cover that, and the forty thousand might give us a leg up on starting some of the the work for Kennedy Court. All right. I think the sense of it is. To I have a comment as well. Sure. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councilman Doring for for emphasizing this and the community for coming out. Um, I, I agree, and I support uh, I support what Councilmember Doring said for the whole area, the El Bonita, Kennedy Court, and La Quinta area to to look at that as soon as possible. So thank you. All right. I think it's the sense of the council to table the item and to bring it back and see how we can approach uh, these three streets, uh, which are in terrible shape. Uh, we all know that, uh, and uh, uh, in, in in this fiscal year. So, very good. I don't think we need a motion to it. Let me just uh, add uh, this comment. My comments are not intended to criticize or judge staff in any way. I like the fact that staff is thinking out of the box, trying to find monies, trying to incorporate existing projects, trying to put them together. That's a good thing. We should, we should promote that. And so I don't want you or staff to take offense to my comments that somehow uh, that was uh, left unstated. I do appreciate the fact that there's a lot of creativity uh, in terms of how we use our funds, and you should be commended for that. All right. So uh, do we need a motion to table it? Or just direction. Okay. okay. Very good. That's tabled. Uh, <clears throat> let me see. The next one uh, is uh, 7.4 consideration and proposed adoption of a resolution accepting the water and wastewater rates and to proceed with Prop 218 requirements of water and wastewater rate schedule changes. Uh, Ms. Mitch, you pulled this one. I did. Thank you. I received some feedback regarding the Prop 218 notice as well as the resolution and then the tables. So I did make some changes to these particular items. They are all in front of you. I am going to do a quick summary of the, cha the, the changes that I have incorporated in here. It is important to note that in order to meet our deadline to be able to change, go with the modified rates and adopt the made modified rates by December 8th, we do have to get the Prop 218 notice to our printers tomorrow to make sure that they get mailed out in time. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. Know that. Also in, our, in the Prop 218 notice, there are references to the, the links to the city website that it takes to the URL for the rate study. If you go to that link right now, it is still the 2016 study. As soon as we have this Prop 218 notice solidified, um, which should be tomorrow, we are going to update the information on the website as well, so those will actually be valid links. So the first item that we made the change in is attachment number three. So that is the calculated water rates and wastewater rates. I simply removed one of the tables that referred to the 30-year debt financing scenario for the water system. It was a cash flow, so I removed that since it actually wasn't a portion of it. I erroneously put that in there. The second item is attachment number one, which is the resolution. So I updated the following changes. In item H, I changed ad hoc water and wastewater committee to the ad hoc utility rate committee. Several times I'd made that. I, I inadvertently put words around, so I changed that. 
Um, I and J, exact same thing. We changed utility rate ad hoc committee to ad hoc utility rate committee. And then an item or letter M, I pluralize model to models just for a little more clarification. And then attachment two, this is where the bulk of the changes were. This was the notice to the public, uh, the Prop 218 notice to the public hearings. There are two copies in front of you. The first is the clean copy, and the second is the red line, so you can see exactly where the red line changes are. The first change um, throughout the document, I did not catch this initially. I changed the word increase to modification to the word modifications because in several instances it is actually a decrease. The, uh, across the board it's a decrease in the water system. The wastewater system primarily decrease um, and there are some increases. So I changed the verbiage to modifications. I added verbiage to the seventh paragraph under wire water and wastewater rate changes needed to include to comply with city council recommendations. So that is now item number one. So instead of having item number th one to three, we now have items number one to four. I changed the page numbers to align with the new pages that we added. Under the proposed water rates, the second paragraph, I added the language under, um, under current and I, I added Proposed, so it said current, and I added current and proposed because both rate, rate models were identical. I added the current five-year water rate schedule for comparison. Before, we only had the comparison to the wastewater because they were two different models, but I added the current water model so it can be compared to the proposed water model. I replaced the proposed water rate table with a table that added some clarification for the use charge per, H, um, per HFC. It was a little unclear um, where MOA homes and multifamily units actually fit. So we added the terminology for HFC to specifically say single family resident, multifamily, and also mobile homes, as well as the line underneath that where it says non-residential. I added the... Um, a footnote in there, or they, Catherine Hansford added a footnote to the non-residential section stating that this includes multifamily and mobile homes. And in the narrative of the Prop 218 notice, that also does state that, and, and this was the change I erroneously had in there, that mobile homes and multifamily is based off of what um, winter water average is, or winter water usage as opposed to actual usage. Uh, the verbiage in the Prop 218 notice said that it was based on actual usage and not on winter average. And that those were my changes. <laughs> so um, thank you for the, the feedback that I received on those were able to get incorporated. Uh, the other item that we will, once we solidify the Prop 218 notice and the resolution, um, we will also be doing Spanish translations that will be available as well. Okay, good. I have uh, a, a question on the resolution. Um, I might not have picked it up, but um, the last page of it under paragraph two, um, the first line says, develop a notice of public hearing on proposed increases to water. Has that been changed to modifications? To modifications, yes. Yes, it has. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, it has. Okay. The only other thing um, I would add, if the rest of the council agrees, is in the notice itself on the first page, the paragraph um, right under why are water and wastewater rates changes needed. Uh, item six, the last part of that, which I discussed with April and Mark just briefly before we came over here. Um, it was not our objective this time around to provide operating reserves of at least 25%. Uh, that was the objective at, in the uh, last rate study, and uh, we changed that here for wastewater six to eight months and water 10 to 14. And I think for the sake of accuracy, it would be great if the notice... Yeah, I corrected that. Yeah. I agree. Certainly. Okay. Any other council uh, discussion? Any public discussion of this item? So, uh, at this point, uh, the chair would uh, 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 accept a motion to approve the resolution presented to us with the changes and modifications as discussed by Ms. Mitz and the further uh, change uh, suggested by Ms. Coberstein. I would love to move approval of this. All right. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Second. Ms. Ms. Black? <laughs> Jeff Hopless? Jeff Hopless. Uh -huh. Councilmember Koperstein? Yes. Council Mayor White? Yes. Councilmember Doreen? Yes. Ellsworth? Yes. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. 
Okay, uh, that takes us then to seven point five uh, consideration proposed adoption of the resolution authorizing the creation authorizing the creation of the capital improvement project Oak Avenue storm drain repair R eighteen eighty two and authorizing the transfer of sixty five thousand from gas tax revenue to R eighteen eighty two. I pulled this item because I thought it was worthwhile to have just a little discussion of what was going on here. Well, I didn't want to cause any alarm in the staff report, so we tried to minimize it. But a couple of few weeks ago, it uh, was brought to our attention that there was a pothole appearing um, at the O container. And um, we, the investigation of it uh, actually was more than a pothole. It was um, a vacuous crater going underneath the asphalt. So we had to steel plate it because the storm drain had basically deteriorated beyond um, a metal pipe is old corrugated metal pipe um, probably 50, beyond 50 60 years old um, just down to the ribs so um, <laughs> we're lucky that we didn't lose more of the street at the time we're monitoring it on a daily basis uh, and make sure um, we, we haven't seen the extent of the damages uh, we're getting um, our on-call contractor on board to start the work hopefully later this week um, to start trying to see how the extent of the damage is. Um, it goes north and a little bit south. We hope it just goes a little bit south towards Mitchell. Um, but um, there's a little bit of a spot at Mitchell as well, and I'm sure it was all installed about the same time. So I'm concerned about the, in the entire integrity of that pipe and along the Street of Oak. So um, we've been very lucky, fortunate this past year with all the rains we received, but I think we need to get this work done um, prior to um, our storm season coming up. When you say monitoring on a daily basis, this is looking at the roadway to see if further cracks are developing? Correct. As opposed to removing the steel plates every day? Correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, the photo we took isn't as the best one, um, you know, as, as printouts happen, but um, we couldn't put a video camera down the section. It already kind of caved in a bit on the pipe, and there's debris obviously stuck in the pipe, um, what's left of it. So um, as soon as we start getting in there and see if there's an open area, we're going to put a video camera down. We do have our own equipment to see if we can kind of see further along there. And um, Nielsen Construction is an underground contractor as well as above ground, so that's how they started. So I'm, I'm hopeful that they can get it done, hopefully within this amount, but it, it might be more. Is this the uh, storm drain where the uh, covers occasionally come off in heavy rains uh, uh, by the Catholic Church there? It, I've seen it spew, uh, for sure. It's a, it's part of it. In front of the school. In front of the school, yeah. It might be interconnected, but... Okay, I mean, I mean it has a geyser there. It, it would explain a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> if it's crushed, I don't know how long it's been crushed, but... Um, um, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, at this point, is there any further council discussion? I just have a question, uh, sort of to revisit what we talked about with Kennedy Court. So um, this is not going to be on that list. Is that where we're moving towards? The reason I ask is I thought I read in these requirements that you can't take this money for reimbursement. Um, that you need to take the money ahead of time. And so if this work is happening, this you know, new 40000 or whatever that we're going to get, um, it wouldn't be eligible if we had already done the work. Is that right, or am I totally off base? SB1, they, it went back to the legislature, and they actually did file an amendment to allow for reimbursable projects, so you can actually start doing work on projects. For this particular project, um, we do have some gas tax money that's available that we already have in our funds, and so uh, Erica is proposing that we take that money from available gas tax money and not consider it part of SB1, but SB1 is allowing for reimbursable costs now. Okay, thanks. But they do have to be on the list that you... Um, put in before October 16th, correct? It doesn't limit us. So if oh, we decide okay. to change and I come back to council and so, like something, Oak Street, we want Oak Street on the list, um, or you can amend your list any time during the year, and that your closeout, we have to annually report back to the state on what we actually did with those funds. So this is not the end all. It's just an annual list we provide to the state right. back on the old item. So, But it doesn't uh, um, disallow you from making changes during the year. All right. Is there any public discussion here? Let me close public comment. Uh, any further council discussion? Uh, then uh, I would entertain a motion to approve uh, consent Move. item 7.5. Move to approve. Second. Is 
City Vice Clerk. <laughs> Vice Mayor White. Yes. Councilmember Ellsworth. Yes. Coberstein. Yes. Story. Yes. Mayor Galbraith. Yes. All right. Uh, let's go to. Uh, now let me go back to the agenda here. See where we are. So the next item is the uh, truck ordinance, uh, and uh, is that you again, uh, Ms. Smithies? Yes, it would be. All right. <laughs> um, this is an item, an introduction and first reading of an ordinance adding Chapter 10.36 of the St. Helena Municipal Code to provide for designated truck traffic routes within the city of St. Helena. Um, this was originally brought forward to council by Council Member Ellsworth. And um, we first brought a draft ordinance to council on July 11th, and we were requested to look at weight restrictions and, um, and um, enforcement and bring it back to council. Um, since then, we, uh, council member Ellsworth, uh, city manager Presswich, um, Chief Imboden, and myself have met and collaboratively worked on, on, and the city attorney's office, of course, to work towards a more final ordinance for the city. Um, what you, we, we did bring um, uh, the mayor uh, had some some recommendations for um, some verbiage changes um, earlier this week, so we've we've provided a revision red line revision on on the dais tonight. If you'd like to look at those, they're minor, but. Um, the, the um, overall goal of the ordinance is to restrict tra traffic um, going th um, off of st State Road um, t Main Street 29 mm -hmm. um, and staying on a direct route instead of taking alternate routes throughout the city for making deliveries. Um, it's restricting truck weights um, to 10,000 pounds uh, to stay on the most direct route, which is Highway 29. Um, it authorizes the police department to enforce and issue a misdemeanor and $1,000 fine when a truck violates the ordinance. Um, any police officer is authorized to require any person driving or in control of any truck being operated on a street within the city other than a specific truck route to proceed to any public or private scale available for the purpose of weighing the vehicle determined when this chapter um, has been violated. Um, the violators will be liable for all damages, cleanup, and administrative costs um, if found in violation. The police department um, has contacted um, several local businesses, three of which have um, offered um, the use of their scales. Um, one in Sutter Home, um, doing business as Trinchero State. No, Trinchero State's doing business as um, Bar a Sutter Home. Um, we have Behringer and then Harold Smith and Sons. Um, so kind of scattered throughout the city, which makes sense because some of those areas are the target areas um, for for vehicles um, using alternate routes. Um, there would also be a, a um, major public outreach um, and, or, and to, before this ordinance went into effect, make sure all delivery, every, everyone's aware of this ordinance going into effect. But then there would also be a, um, uh, an, an increase of code enforcement, which if you guys have any questions, Chief Eminence in the audience here to um, answer any of the, that end of the enforcement questions. So mm -hmm. with that, we bring forward the reading. And the options here are um, move forward the ordinance as, as drafted, um, provide feedback and direction to staff on the proposed ordinance and make modifications as um, the city council determines, um, or continue with no specific ordinance. Um, right. but just one quick comment here in response to a question that uh, Mr. Smithers, uh, Smithers. Smithers uh, 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 posed to me, and that is that uh, passenger buses under the jurisdiction of the Public Utilities Commission uh, are exempt because they hold certificates from the Public Utilities Commission and we cannot regulate their movement. So that's a legal issue where there isn't much we can do about it. Uh, and that was confirmed with council. Correct. The same would go for moving vans. Okay. All right. Uh, any further, any council discussion? We, we cannot, um, we cannot direct their movement as opposed to, can we, what, what can we do with respect to um, passenger buses and moving vans? Can we um, pass a law saying you can't park in a certain area? I mean, I, I'm, I'm wondering what the extent of, of uh, our limitations are in terms of dealing with passenger buses and moving vans? My office has not explored that yet. We looked at this ordinance um, really through the lens of several model ordinances that we looked at with Council Member Ellsworth uh, in coming up with what um, I think he felt comfortable with uh, at the Council's direction. Um, for a model for this ordinance, every model we looked at included this exemption for PUC regulated buses, but 
I would need to I would need to undertake research to see what the extent of our um, uh, regulatory authority might be over um, over those buses. I haven't done it yeah. yet. Uh, Mr. Smith has also pointed out that there are other jurisdictions that post signs saying no, no passenger uh, buses here, and so may, I'm not sure it's going to preclude me from moving forward on this truck ordinance tonight. But I think that's something that we should at least explore to see why other cities, municipalities, and counties have truck uh, or, or passenger bus restrictions. It may have to do with where they're parking, but I'm not sure. I've just seen uh, Mr. Smithers' pictures of these different signs and something to explore in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I also wonder if it turns on what the definition of a passenger bus is, because a lot of the buses that we have in town uh, are not no, everybody can't hop on them and go for a ride. They are essentially limousine services using very large vehicles. And, uh, you know, I could understand why a passenger bus like the Vine Line or whatever isn't subject to this. But a lot of what's running around town um, on these other streets is not the Vine Line. But they're still regulated by the PUC. They have to have their permits, even the smaller uh tour buses are regulated by the PC. I'm just wondering if they actually fall within the definition of passenger bus, because there was always that issue with the wine train. It wasn't really providing point-to-point -point passenger service, and I'm just might be worth looking at. It's an easy okay. thing to look at. So many, you know, other cities have really invented this wheel previously, so it's not like we would be inventing this research. It's something that we can look into. Sometimes the extent of preemption is limited uh, in terms of whether you are undertaking to uh, to prohibit altogether uh, on certain locations or whether you are undertaking to regulate where they stop or stand or as you were saying with respect to the class of passenger or the definition of the passenger we we can certainly look into that All right. any other initial questions before i open the public hearing yeah my thoughts were um uh also thinking oh you know we should include that, but then kind of rethinking it, it that um, if we do want to look at, because I went online today and looked at other cities, San Francisco, Santa Monica, Carmel, um, who deal with tour buses and things like that, and they have some specific language. I think it's a another exercise, you know, in looking, looking into it um, and maybe finding some things that those, as you say, the wheel's been invented and may have some things to do with idling buses and that sort of thing. So I'm comfortable moving forward with this as a truck ordinance, but with the idea that we revisit soon, very quickly, the, the idea of looking at something that would include buses or what kind of language could we, um, could we have for that. So that's where I'm, I'm at. All right. Uh, and, mo and moving vans. And moving vans, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me open the public hearing. Anybody wish to speak at public hearing? Mr. Smithers? Now that we've already spoken for you, Mr. Smithers, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I did want to sort of go on the record that uh, I appreciate all the efforts of, of staff and the police chief and everybody working on this because I, I do believe it's, it's pretty important and it will improve um, the quality of life in our neighborhoods. I think it's also important, I, I think I heard Mark say that there's maybe a $9 million price tag on fixing our streets, and it seems to me you'd want to get a truck ordinance in place before you start fixing all the streets and spending that $9 million and then just beat the streets up again. So I, I do believe it's, it's, it's important. I, and I guess I did bring up those issues of the buses and the moving vans. Um, and I would I would say that I guess where I where I am at this point in time is to paraphrase my wife, who's much more intelligent than I am. Um, she says, "Don't let the perfect get in the way of the good." So I mean, I think we've got 85 percent of what will really help our streets and our neighborhoods here. So I would encourage you to implement this as it is written and move forward with it, and maybe you know revisit. The issue of tour buses, I, you know, like Carmel by the Sea has something. They have a specific ordinance on tour buses and restrictions that they have. But if you if you go down that path, it could be six more months before anybody gets done with the truck ordinance. So I would say I would encourage you to go forward with the truck ordinance and then revisit the other couple of items later. So, okay. but thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further public comment? Then I'll close public comment uh, and. Yeah. No, wait, oh, yes. Uh, 
Um, my name is Jane Skeels, and I live at 1120 Valley View here in Santa Elena. And I uh, support a truck ordinance. I live on a street that is often used as uh, the back street uh, to get around. And um, I, uh, it, it's the big trucks. It's the cement trucks. It's the gravel trucks. It's the double kinds of trucks that are going down the street. And sometimes they come in from the north and go down, you know, the way and pass my, my street and my house. Um, I think it's a safety issue. I mean, there's people and families that live there, and it would be horrible for something to happen. And uh, these, these trucks need to go in a designated way to get to, their, to the fastest place that they need to go. And that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. Thank you. Any further public comment? All right. Then I'll close public comment. Uh, uh, and I would just like to offer one more um, uh, point. Um, I note that on the Caltrans uh, website, they actually provide for uh, putting a link of your truck route map. And there are several jurisdictions. I think Napa has one. None of the other jurisdictions in Napa County have one, but I think it would be helpful. I think that's a place that uh, the Trucking Association and truckers and, and bus companies, they look to a link on that site. And so you'll, you'll note, you just put that in there, you Google that, and you'll see all these various links to various um, uh, truck routes maps. I Good idea. And I have one one other comment that's come up in relationship with uh, enforcement and compliance um, in that um, it's been brought up that that I guess there are certain areas where there are, um, f um, f what's the word, the, the ticket is given, but it um, hasn't been followed through in terms of collection. There's So maybe some other, some element also of of looking at our, our making sure that our enforcement compliance has a follow through mechanism to make sure that if, if somebody's ticketed and there's a fine that it's followed through to make sure that we're actually it, doing the collection as well of the funds. There's some... There's One of the things we, we undertook uh, in that regard was to include uh, not unlike you know, provisions we have in other ordinances um, such as the short-term rental ordinance to put in a, um, a civil penalty provision that is um, different from the criminal citation, the, the infraction or misdemeanor citation that then goes through the court system. This would be one that is, that is imposed civilly. It does allow for an administrative appeal of that for fairness to people who, who might want to contest that. Um, and it, it in our view, is is something that is worth trying um, to address that problem that you you identified there. Okay. We discussed that with with staff and band, um, and that was determined to be an appropriate um, provision to include in there. Great, thank you. All right. Any further council discussion? <clears throat> then the chair would uh, accept a motion to approve the truck ordinance uh, in the redlined version. So moved. Mr. Ellsworth? Second. <laughs> City Clerk? I just wanted for clarification that you're introducing it by title only and waiving further reading. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, Vice of Mayor course. White? Yes. Councilmember Ellsworth? Yes. Hoverstein? Yes. Doreen? Yes. Uh, Mayor Galbraith? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and then. <coughs> Well, you have long 9.2. To uh, council discussion and direction on traffic safety enhancements on Highway 29 and Pratt Avenue vicinity. So this item would, um, this came out of the, the parking ad hoc committee and also a lot of the community um, concerns throughout the beginning of this year and I guess late last year with, with the construction of Los Alcabas. Um, the concerns, um, uh, were of speeding through the tunnel, um, mi near misses and vehicles being rented from vehicles speeding southbound the tunnel into the city of St. Helena, and also because they're stopping at the crossing now that it's probably being more utilized um, at the crossing at Pratt and Main Street. Um, and it's just, when you look at some of the accidents, a lot of the accidents happened during the construction. We had a construction worker hit in the crosswalk um, less than a year ago. We were trying to get some statistics on, on 
what was going on in the crosswalk, but um, we haven't gotten the feedback on that yet. But um, the ideas of implementation was um, either trying to reduce the speed signs, um, enhance the crosswalk, um, and then or also putting uh, radar, speed radar signs on on 29. I reached out to um, Caltrans regarding this and got some immediate feedback um, with regard to enhancing the crosswalk, either putting a Hawk system, which is a high-end uh, signalized intersection. Um, um, if you might have seen those in it's downtown city of Napa. It looks like a signal that's green until a pedestrian comes in and, and hits hits the, the walk button. Um, the less expensive route, the big big route is about two hundred three hundred thousand dollar expenditure because you're putting in signals basically the um, infrastructure for signals. Um, the the midway point is just putting the re reflective rapid flashing beacons, um, which is the the LED lit signs as well as the flashing beacons below them, and they don't allow in pavement lights now across 29 it's just a maintenance um, um, mm -hmm. it, it's the maintenance on those is awful um, and then they've got traffic control and we already know how awful it is when you close a lane on uh, Main Street during daytime time um, daytime hours so um, that was an alternative that's about a ten to fifteen thousand dollar expenditure you need one on both sides of the street I believe that's the total cost is about up to fifteen thousand dollars and then you have the the um, speed radar signs which I think would be great going into the um, into town as well on the way out okay. and um, they also take uh, traffic data on, on speed speed curve data and um, so those are already in our budget. Um, I was going to implement those on Pratt, but since the bridge is closed, I think maybe we could move those over to sure. Main Street. Um, those are about six thousand dollars total. There's about three grand each. Um, but part of the Caltrans process is that we still need to do a traffic evaluation assessment, determining the need and why we need those signs. Um, but an actual speed reduction um, is going to be the difficult part. Um, that's been the contention. Can we can we reduce the speed from 35 to 25 on uh, before entering the city? And um, that's all driven behind speed surveys. And the recent one done was about a couple of years ago. And, and most times when they do those speed surveys, the speeds actually go up, which we don't want here. Um, the idea was possibly floated that um, they could be legislatively um, reduced it, um, but no one's been through that process. I haven't checked with any other jurisdictions to see if they've actually gone through a process of trying to, um, by legislation, state, bring down the speed limit coming into St. Helena. But, um, but it was sad news to hear that if we actually were to go back through a study, it might actually raise the speed limit um, through that tunnel coming into the city, which doesn't make sense to me. But, um, but so what we're bringing forward to you is, is, is council discussion because there is some cost to this, um, you know, traffic study or evaluation to go through the encroachment process with Caltrans, um, and then, like I said, the the cheapest fix is the radar signs. We have those. We still need to do the evaluation. Um, and then the next step was um, the enhanced crosswalk. Um, we've had Behringer, um, and Culinary Institute of America, and Los Alcabas state um, about a share, um, contributing to a share. I'm not sure about the CIA, but I know at least Behringer and Los Alcabas have, have committed a, a sharing of the, and that enhanced crosswalk. Um, but not knowing what the cost is, and but we'd like to move forward. You know, they all need a traffic assessment and needs assessment to get through Caltrans, but um, this is, it is on their system. So I'm looking at council for direction. Uh, refresh me again on what the enhanced crosswalk is. Is that like the one at the Copia in Napa? Maybe you don't know that one, but uh, you can get across. I think it is uh, First Street there. Uh, it's got flashing yellow lights on each side. The pedestrian presses it. Yes. Uh, but there's nothing in the street itself. Well, in pavement lights are called enhanced crosswalks. The Hawk system, which is the signalized crosswalk, enhanced crosswalk, and then okay. the rapid reflective beacon, RRFBs, is another um, enhanced crosswalk. We just had um, Davies as part of their um, conditions of approval um, install just, just the LED lit signs, which for a, a slow residential street, that, that suffices, but on a higher speed, you want more lights to, to make um, pedestrian awareness to the to motorized traffic. Okay, so what I think you're, uh, what I think you're su suggesting is the ones where the pedestrian presses the signal and then it flashes yellow uh, on the side of the street and then the pedestrian crosses. Correct. Okay. Well, uh, uh, I'm certainly for moving the putting in those uh, speed uh, signs, you taking advantage of those speed signs, getting the approach permit and putting in the speed signs, uh, seeing what that can do for us. That, that's what I'm bringing to council here is those, those, you know, 
the speed signs is one, but also the alternatives as far as do, do we want to move forward with also looking at the enhancement, enhanced crosswalk, whether it's the expensive version or the lower, um, also recommended by Caltrans was, was the RRFBs, which is the lit signs only on both sides instead of a signalized intersection. Yeah. Yeah. So does the Hawk actually then have a like a flashing light that stops the traffic on 29? So the Hawk system is like a signal. It's the three, the amber, the green, the green, the amber, and the red lights. So it looks like a signal, but usually it's always green unless a pedestrian pushes the button. Then it goes to the caution and then the red. So maybe if you're trying to make a left turn, you can jump out of your car and push the button. <laughs> <laughs> Carry a long Can it be stick? upgraded at some point to a full uh, signal once once you do that? I believe so. Because we looked at this when I, the prior city I worked at, we were looking at that. That was like one step forward on getting a certain intersection in the city um, uh, to signalize. But um, we went with the the overhead. There's also the overhead lights, enhanced crossing with the um, the walker symbol. It's, so it's another signal, but it's a less expensive one. Um, that just has the person pedestrian walking and then the, again the, the side street uh, lit signs I've done a lot of these so <laughs> oh. what one thing that strikes me is that we've got another item coming up tonight on the elm tunnel which is in the same area with the same players the same businesses in the area that might be discussing some type of revamping of the elm tunnel or how we how we address the elm tunnel is this project something that could be considered in conjunction so that that it's it's thought of a little bit more as an overall project maybe when you get to the elm tunnel issue we'll see a tie-in that says oh if we're going to be if Barringer and Las Alcobas have have uh, uh, offered to to sort of pitch in on the traffic safety of this area, the, the uh, crosswalk area, is there an element in the Elm Tunnel issue that ties into that? Um, I'm just bringing that up so that we, we consider that, that it's maybe one big project rather than two separate smaller projects. So just a thought. Do you, do you see any tie in yourself? I don't because that's just going to be removing dead trees and then the city comes in and replaces them with live trees. But if there's some thought, um, we need to do the traffic evaluation to see the best placement of any radar signs for one. So I don't think there could be really any tie in there. But, um, but I think we have some Caltrans um, in the audience here so they can help me collaborate on that one. <laughs> it was just, it was just, I'm going to open it to public okay. hearing and if Caltrans uh, has any thoughts on this I, item, they can come forward. Okay, I just have one more comment in, in that if if we're looking at the elm tunnel and and there's some reconfiguration of the the entrance to it um it, it just might be worth discussing so anyway i'll leave it at that all right uh any any further initial yeah. uh, council comment let me let me open this item up to public hearing and then we'll talk about some more anybody wish to speak at public hearing Peter Edlow, 1817 yeah. Main Street. Before I get started, Erica, maybe you could remind me what the name of the speed bumps I'm looking for. It's the table, the tabletop bumps. So this this is straying from the focus on Main Street, and I obviously think the speed limit needs to come down. I can't believe we're thwarted by the state government and our own. I mean, our city limit starts outside the tunnel. I mean, why can't we dictate our own speed limit? But anyway, and I do think a signal is critical. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be long before something happens that's going to be pretty catastrophic. But there is a uh, known <coughs> western bypass that starts at Elmhurst. And when traffic backs up on Main Street, cars turn up Elmhurst. And they are all, always in a hurry. And they're heading up Elmhurst going across the west side of town. Uh, <coughs> my daughter lives in Portland. When I go up there, they use these tabletop speed bumps all over town. And they, they got put in initially because people were using side roads to get through town because the, the uh, highways were backed up. And you can take these bumps at 30 miles an hour and you don't really notice them. But they do keep the people from gutting up above that speed. And I've been for years suggesting that we bring these in, a couple in on Elmhurst, and uh, at least stop the traffic from just accelerating up, up Elmhurst the way it, way it does. 
And I think it could probably be useful if I can't know if we could put it on Main Street, but hell, maybe that might might work out I there. I think we're going to hear from Caltrans on that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm sure. But anyway, I just wanted to put my two cents in on that and see if we can add that to the list of safety issues for for the area. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Edelin. Um, Bobby Monetta, speaking as a, a citizen. Um, I, I talked to Caltrans a few years ago, and they said that the state highway can have a roundabout um, and, and different intersections. And I was wondering if anyone has considered um, a roundabout for that intersection. It's only three, you know, a three-way intersection, but um, that would certainly slow people down. And I don't know if it would even be practical. It just crossed my mind as I was listening to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Griffin, uh, 1824 Park. Uh, the thing is, in this intersection, there's just so much going on, and the crosswalks here seems to be the main issue. So I think one solution might be is move it down the street, get it out of that intersection, put it down. Uh, I remember like years ago we used to have one across from the Roxy Theater there, or the Cameo, what do they call it now. They took it out. But, I mean, move the crosswalk down towards Elmhurst more, so, uh, you know, they got a little bit of time to react when they're in the crosswalk. They can run faster and get out of there, whatever the case may be. But you just have too much stuff going on in this intersection. you got uh, the left-hand turn lane. Uh, the other day I was coming northbound. Uh, the traffic's all backed up. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I finally got to Cornella where I get over to my house. I go up to Pratt Avenue. I look. Here's a 58-foot semi. He obviously missed a turn or he knew he couldn't get up to Los Acobas. So he goes through the tree tunnel, got turned around somewhere. I sat there for half an hour while he sat in the left-hand turn lane to turn on Pratt on a cell phone to contact somebody at Los Acobas to come down and, and show him where to deliver the stuff over to Behringer's. And that goes on all the time. And pretty soon here comes the Pinsky truck and, come on, follow me. And down Pratt Avenue they go and they, you know, so he just blocked traffic for over... I was there and watched it for half an hour, so he was there probably 15 minutes before that. So I think that, that, that crosswalk, if, if you moved it down the street some and, and looked at maybe putting the, the red curb on the other side of the street where it should be instead of in front of all the people's houses that took away their property values, uh, you might make things a little bit better there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Yes. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Vince Chicala. I'm the Caltrans Public Information Officer here in Napa County. Um, thank you, Mayor Galbraith and the City Council, Ms. Smithies, and everyone here from Santa Lena for welcoming us back to your city. Um, I, I just I heard the discussion, obviously, about the Hawk system. I wanted to clarify clarify it a little bit. The way that the Hawk system works is actually it's a pedestrian. Um, signal light basically it's different from a regular traditional signal light signal light turns red yellow green what happens with the with the hawk system is when a pedestrian comes up to the crosswalk there's a pole on the ground with a button you press it if you're a pedestrian and then what happens is that activates the system then the system flashes yellow then it flashes red then it turns solid red and then what happens then is then cars obviously mandated to stop. And then the pedestrians can cross the street safely. Once, you know, after a little while, um, if no one else is crossing or no one else activates the system, what happens is the system, it just turns off. So instead of it going green, it just turns off. The reasoning behind that, and I'm sorry, I apologize, I'm not a traffic safety expert. I'm kind of a generalist, being the public information officer. The way the traffic engineers explained it to me is that once, once the pedestrian is crossed safely, then it just turns off and it allows a free flow of traffic when there's no pedestrians present. If you're looking for an example of it, we actually are working on implementing it in Vallejo on Highway 29, which is also known as Sonoma Boulevard. We actually have four different intersections in Vallejo that had, in the past, high rates of pedestrian accidents. Caltrans worked very closely with the city of Vallejo to implement these, and right now we're working closely with PG&E to get them up and running. So the ones in Vallejo should be up and running in the next month or so. Um, Caltrans does have them actually also running the Hawk system in San Francisco. If you ever drive in the city, it's on Slope Boulevard. 
And also, um, for public information, Caltrans actually, Caltrans Public Affairs, I think it's in Colinga, they actually did a news flash video with the public information off of the, in that area, actually demonstrating what it is. And I can, obviously I can send you the link. If you'd like to view it, they actually walk you through how it works. And then obviously, um, once we get the one running up in Vallejo, we'd like to do some more information as far as getting it out in the North Bay of what it is. So, you know, thank you again. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I do know we, you know, we do have a presentation about the Tunnel of Elms. So obviously we can, you know, talk a little bit more. Um, but I, I just wanted to clarify on that point. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Can, uh, can somebody from uh, Caltrans speak to the issue, the concept of non-apparent conditions? Does anybody know about what that concept is? It's in your manual, and it basically is is the ability to not to to bypass the need to do a speed survey when you have a situation like, in my view, Cal, uh, the the tree tunnel is where it's curving slightly, it's uphill, people are coming through a sort of a narrow tunnel, and then immediately they're hit with a crosswalk. Uh, uh, right across uh, Highway 29. In my view, that would uh, allow uh, a five mile, five mile uh, an hour reduction. It, we wouldn't get to 25, but we'd get from 35 to 30 because of the quote non-apparent condition. And these condi th this happens all throughout the state of California when you have situations where you have a lot of folks that have driveways uh, coming backing up or they're extra pedestrians or just kind of unusual circumstances that will allow uh, a jurisdiction like ours to have to, to be able to bypass um, having to do this study or wait for this new survey. Um, does anybody know about that? Because I think it would be something that would be useful here to, to explore. Thank you. This is Kelly Hirschberg. I'm a regional project manager from Caltrans. Actually, I do not have uh, sufficient information to provide respond to you right now at this point, but I could certainly go back and, you know, we have a traffic engineer who has uh, expertise in that material, and I could work with a public work director to provide the further information. Is that? Thank you. Uh, yeah. sure. uh, that, that, that would be terrific. I think we'd all appreciate that. Thanks for raising that, uh, mm -hmm. Council Member Doran. Uh, any further public comment here? Uh, all right. Uh, let me close the public comment. Please take a seat, and we'll get to the tree, tree, uh, um, <laughs> tree uh, tunnel in just a few minutes here. But do we have further discussion? Uh, are we at a point where, where we should be saying uh, to our public works director, you've heard a lot, and come back with uh, what you think is your best recommendation? At this point, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I you know I think uh, well for myself, uh, I certainly uh, I'm interested in having those uh, two um, um, uh, 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 speed flashers uh, that were supposed to go on Pratt Avenue, not needed there for the moment. Uh, but keeping in mind uh, when Pratt Avenue is reopened, uh, if it is reopened, that we need we're going to need those. We're going to need new ones there, uh, but nevertheless, it seems to me not inappropriate to uh, to uh, use them on, on 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 Highway 29 for now. But I, you'll have to go through the encroachment uh, process and deal with the with what uh, Council Member Doring has raised about the non-apparent condition, uh, and uh, because that's going to fix where you um, can set the speed limit, uh, and then we need to talk perhaps a little bit more about the crosswalk. Uh, but uh, I don't know that I feel comfortable trying to make a trying to provide direction with respect to that tonight. I'd like to particularly take a look at this uh, online at the Hawk system, uh, which I'm, and perhaps even go look at one in Vallejo. Actually, I believe there's two in Napa. There's one on Jefferson, um, just north of the high school uh, at the railroad oh, oh, tracks, and there's okay, one then. on Lincoln um, between Jefferson and Soskill. And I, I thought it was a solid green when it's um, not, not, there's no pedestrians there, but I could be wrong. Um, Where the bicycle path comes across on the, yeah, correct. On Jefferson. Yeah, Jefferson between Soskill and, and um, I mean, on Lincoln between uh, Je uh, Jefferson and Soskill. Mm -hmm. So those are the most the, the most recent ones, the one there on Lincoln, I believe. Okay, good. Um, and then the RFBs, I'm not sure if there's any in, in Napa anywhere. I know that we just replaced our in-pavement lights in um, Petaluma Boulevard um, in Petaluma before I left there um, because of the high maintenance on the in-pavement. So, um, 
that's a nearby city as well um, if they don't have it online already in Vallejo. I do think we should explore the potential for a public-private partnership there. We have a lot of different yes. stakeholders involved, uh, Behringer, Las Alcobas, CIA, the city of uh, St. Helena, of course, and Caltrans. You would think that that 250,000, I don't I recall the number you gave, that, you know, if each one put up 50,000, maybe it's something that's doable. And I don't know. And I do want to throw out there, I, d I did um, budget an amount for traffic study just in the event that we might have something like this come up, because I do get a lot of questions throughout the year um, about, you know, what about this intersection of this? But I knew this one was a hot topic, so um, there is money in our um, for, for traffic right. review. That maybe they would enhance it, but I would want your um, direction on... Um, maybe it's potential I can get some costs to see um, maybe just the radar sign evaluation right now, but maybe I could loop in the enhanced crosswalk and what that would cost from a consultant. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I are these radar signs, I mean, those are the things that move all around town and tell you what your speed no. is. Do we actually have the right of way to put them in or right in front of the tree tunnel without causing a problem? I mean, when I see them in my neighborhood, they're in a parking lane usually. These are permanent ones. Right. So we do have the mobile one that goes around. Um, we already have a couple on, three on order. Uh, two are for Elmhurst, and uh, one's for replacement on uh, uh, South Crane. So so this would be off the pavement? Yes. In, in, in the right of way. That's why you have to get a encroachment permit with Caltrans. It's because right. on, so it would be, it'd be per, per, permanent. I don't believe there's any post available out there, but it depends on the placement, which is the traffic assessment. Right. And what, I mean, what do we attribute the increase in pedestrian traffic to at this point? I mean, if the construction has stopped, um, what's, who's crossing the street there? Do we have any idea? Well, I think traffic counts or, or um, pedestrian counts are, are definitely a must at that intersection. I don't know if we can get volunteers to our um, ATSC committee or, for, you know, but Active Transportation Committee or if we need to pay a consultant to have someone actually sit mm -hmm. there. I think that's definitely data we need to see how much um, foot traffic we get across that. I've seen quite a few. Uh, not all of them are employees. I can tell you that. They're, they're either locals or people walking around, which is a good thing. Yeah. So is that enough direction? Um, to, I, I really think we should be taking a look at, at all the options for the crosswalk and, and then um, if you can talk with uh, Kelly to find out if, if we have to do the survey or we can get around that. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, it would be terrific yeah. to lower the speed limit. And I must say, uh, it, bothers me deeply that uh, since city limits uh, uh, are out at Deer Park uh, uh, Avenue that uh, we can't regulate the speed limit coming into coming within our city or have better control over it but I guess it, it, it is what it is in a highly bureaucratic and we state. don't want the liability uh, Mr. Mayor <laughs> okay hey, Caltrans have that. <laughs> <laughs> okay you're right about that Anyway, do you have a, enough direction at this point? I believe so. The first one is definitely to look into the radar signs, but if maybe we can get like an, a, a, a systematic approach to the evaluation with Caltrans, maybe we could lump in all those concerns for the enhancement of the crosswalk as well as the radar signs with the, the, the same traffic engineer mm -hmm. um, that would meet Caltrans qualifications so that we can at least get the, the radar signs in and get a cost and, and approval to move forward with or bring back to council later either a uh, recommended hawk system and or the RRFB. Right. Yeah. Okay. Very so, good. Thank you. So just to uh, uh, seek additional clarification on this, we're tonight we're talking about sort of small, medium, large. Mm -hmm. Large being signal, medium being hawk, uh, small being some of the signs. Is the direction to exclude the further analysis of the signal at this time and the potential for cost sharing or to bring back all three with additional data and thinking related to options? I, I would say the latter, uh, uh, including exploring cost sharing, absolutely. Yes. But, but move forward with the radar signs at the That's minimum. That's right. At the minimum, the small, but mm -hmm. look at the larger picture. Right. I mean, we have the radar signs just sitting there. They should be utilized. <laughs> you need what, to order them. <laughs> uh, what's involved with the um, Elmhurst? Uh, is that something you just look into internally, the idea of traffic calming devices or speed bumps or whatever? How, how does that issue? 
Speed. Happen. So California Fire Code, um, they have the ultimate say on what can go in. And um, they, they regulate whether or not we can put, I'm not saying the appropriate wording, but um, they can tell me no to the speed table, which is unfortunate. Um, and Maybe you could just investigate that and report back. Okay. I mean, I, I see it myself. The traffic backs up and people don't want to turn on Madrona, so they're, they scoot over on Elmhurst and... Right, and also we've had um, multiple uh, complaints on Oak uh, to where people are coming off of Spring Mountain, coming down, I think it's Hillview, and then hitting Oak hmm. over to um, Madrona. Um, In and that's been a problem. Yeah. Where I know one CHP officer or retired okay. officer had... Um, actually clock somebody doing 65 there so could use a few speed bumps or a stop sign <laughs> <laughs> well that's also why we thought maybe the initial would start would be the radar signs and the ones mm -hmm. we're ordering now they still do um traffic analysis as far as the, the speed data they let us know when the the uh speeding is occurring so that we can enforce it with um police department so yeah. they can target right do, do the radar speed signs ha uh, come with the actual posted speed limit, or could you put that there next to or either below or above? Don't they, they flash also when you're above the speed limit? Right. No, I, I understand that. There's two things going on here. Yeah. You have what the posted speed limit is, and then you have a flash telling you if you're driving at that limit. But there's been a bunch of studies that say if you just have the flashing without the actual legal limit there, that people don't respond to that, but once they see the posted speed limit, and then they see there, it's a, that's the feedback loop. They say, "Oh, I'm not uh, driving according to the speed limit." So the question is, do these signs that we have come with both posted speed limit and um, a radar speed limit uh, of what the driver's, uh, the vehicle's uh, speed is? I believe so. I'm trying to think if I've ever okay. seen it without it. But. Okay. It would be good to look at. Yeah, I, I regularly review the sign on Pope, and and I'm re constantly reminded to keep that <laughs> speed down. <laughs> Same here. Okay, good. <laughs> that one. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, a council member has called for a five-minute break. <laughs> that normally goes to about seven minutes. So, uh, well. We'll reconvene at 7.45.
very well. We're at uh, 9.3, which is an information update on the Elm Tunnel by Caltrans. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you again. My name is Vince Chicala. I'm with Caltrans Public Affairs. Um, we did want to um, do a presentation about the Tunnel of Elms, so I did want to um, introduce our, our project team that joins us here tonight. Um, we have Jean, Jean Gorham with our Landscape Architecture Department. Uh, Kelly Hirschberg, who's our regional project manager for Napa County, and Brett Rushing, who's with our cultural um, cultural affairs department. So we actually um, uh, we wanted to talk tonight about the the Tunnel of Elms and the maintenance and upkeep of the Tunnel of Elms. Um, coming to your city tonight, I mean it's a it's a beautiful city. Every time I've been here, um, and we are we were here and are here quite a bit. Um, if you remember, we, we did have the Highway 29 channelization project for the last two years, and uh, that was an improvement to, to travel through the Up Valley. Um, we added a left turn pocket lane, and it has seemed to seem to work. Um, and as far as you know, the, the acoustics and, and the beauty of Salina, um, you know, my city, we do have trees too. And at Caltrans, we're very sensitive to trees and how it looks. We do understand, and you know, that it's a it's a main entrance to your city. So we want to, you know, let you know that we are committed to working with you and keep working with you to keep the highway open and safe for for you and for all your families and all and everyone who travels on the highway. So um, w K Kelly's going to talk a little bit more, kind of like kind of the nuts and bolts of what we're doing with uh, with our maintenance with the trees ongoing from this point, and then um, uh, the rest of our team's going to kind of um, add with their specialties, and then um, once Kelly's done with the presentation, we'd be glad to answer any of your questions. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so it works, right? So uh, basically, what we'd like to actually provide uh, updates to you and just kind of going over what we'll cover this evening and provide uh, uh, kind of the form for any questions, answers that you may have or the public have on, on what we are planning to do. So just want to kind of emphasize our ongoing partnership. So we've been working pretty close to the city of uh, St. Helena and then you know, this being a, uh, it's on the National Register of a Historic Place, the, the Behringer itself, and then Elm Tunnel is the component to that. And then it, as a, a, a state-owned uh, historic property, you know, we have a you know, responsibility for maintaining and preserving that as well. So. Uh, more than other type of uh, the tree rows, you know, we definitely take more care into it. And and one of our commitment is to come here today and a group of us to provide updates to you. So kind of wanted to uh, emphasize that the shared maintenance with the city of St. Helena, that it has been a joint effort. And then uh, at the same time, uh, we do uh, annual inspection, and then sometimes uh, it's unfortunate that uh, some of the tree just doesn't make it, and then and then we have to come in, into the terms of uh, is it prudent to remove or can we prune it and that kind of stuff. So we're here to provide some updates on that, and then also the replanning effort. So. Uh, as you probably seen the future uh, pictures, you know, back in 2012, I did close to about, not 50, but 44 trees of those uh, elm uh, were actually replanted. And then we took quite a bit of care, meaning is um, kind of determine what would be the most suitable type of elm. So we we actually work with the, I mean, Jean will talk about more, but we work with the UC Davis professor to see what type of strands of elm would be the Dutch elm disease kind of I mean, resistance, because you can't really prove it, right? I mean, it, it just, 
it's kind of spread throughout the tree. So that information and also uh, work with the city as far as a replanting effort and then also the care of watering and then maintenance responsibility. So uh, with that, and then, you know, we'll be available for any questions and answer. So I uh, just want to give you a quick few pictures, the current tree condition. So this is uh, one slide. Oops. And that's from taking from another side. And what we want to show you is, uh, uh, can you see those uh, kind of skinnier trees? So those are uh, what was planted back in 2012. And I mean, I think most of them survived. So kind of wanted to show you that it's, it's looking better. It, it takes time. And then unfortunately, these are some of the pictures of a uh, disease and dead trees. So what we wanted to do is uh, we have uh, uh, trees and then we're going to tag each one of them with the pictures to show you the current condition and why it's necessary for us to uh, come and talk to you. So as far as the schedule goes of our uh, plan, I guess, the maintenance and removal and replanting. So the, uh, as we talked about before, so this is being a national historic place. Uh, we have a, a SHPO, State Highway uh, Preservation Office, and I think Brad knows a lot more of that than I do. But basically, uh, with, with that office, uh, any impact that we do on these trees, we do have to consult with them and then provide the update as to the reasons for doing it. And then one of the things that uh, is required, uh, and then we like to actually do it too, is to come in, uh, provide the updates to the city council meeting as this. And we'll be also sending out the, the letters to uh, local stakeholders regarding what our plan removal is. And um, uh, another thing that uh, we thought that it was a good idea, because I think it was in, I heard uh, from previous uh, maybe possible uh, public works or the, that, there's some of these like kind of, if we put up the board, right, and then hang kind of like cardboard on all these uh, 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 affected trees so that people could see it, and some of them will be pretty uh, apparent that they're dead and diseased. So kind of wanted to show them in a public viewing so that you could see what it looks like. And then as we are pro progress with the work, we'll definitely work uh, with the uh, uh, public works, maybe even county, to provide the traffic advisory because it will be taking probably one main in each direction. It's f I mean one main, so you have a traffic control. So kind of uh, tell them way in advance as to what uh, point of the work is. So uh, and then you know what we're looking at is the uh, there's a time frame. So basically, what we have to do or what we like to do is uh, come out and. Uh, kind of work with the local stakeholders and get the information back. And we also have to send a, uh, a reporting to the SHPO. And they do have about 30 days review time. So that really puts us in somewhere in November as far as getting the finding back before we could proceed. And then, you know, when you're hitting in the no middle of November, you're close to Thanksgiving and you could have an increment weather with the rains and stuff. So we'll be working. What we hope to do is have it done within this year, but we're looking at this winter as a, a time that we plan to do. And as far as the tree replanting, so what we are doing is also we provide the trees to the city, and then uh, the city will go ahead and, and replant it where all these empty spots are. So those will be uh, later on, and that's something that we need to work more closely with the city of St. Helena for that plan work. So with that, I think uh, actually Jean is uh, 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 office chief at landscape and architect, and so she has a vast knowledge of a uh, tree uh, way more than I do. So I thought I'd like to actually come up, have her come up and provide you updates on this. Okay, thank you. To the right? Yeah, to the right. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a, this is a, a view of the Elm Tunnel. Um, and all, we, we have all the trees labeled in our own mapping system just to show what is, this, what is an original tree, what is a replacement tree, so we can track the replacement trees um, to see which selection is performing better. 
Um, last time we had an issue with needing to remove several trees is back in 2012. Um, I worked with the city arborist at that time who has retired since, but we did meet with a, um, a doctor, uh, Larry Costello from UC uh, Department of Agriculture, and he is a professional researcher, and he specifically studies, one of the things he studies is Dutch elm disease in California, and it's very important that uh, the research that is happening is happening in California because we want to know what's going to be the most successful locally. Um, a lot of Dutch elm research happens in other parts of the country where we have, you know, very severe winters and is um, more of within the natural habitat of an elm tree, and we're well outside of the natural habitat of an elm tree here in California. Um, so we met with Dr. Costello and had a few uh, meetings with him, but he has a test plot in Atherton where he's got. Um, several species of elms that have been planted there and he's monitoring them for over 20 years. So he was able to fill us in on what is actually working in California and that's what we ended up with two tree species out there, the Alkalade and the Frontier are two different varieties of elms that are cultivars and um, that was based on our interaction with him because we felt like Nothing is a sure bet out there. It's a very uh, severe hot spot of D Dutch elm disease, but these two show the most promise in California. So this, uh, the most recent inspection of the elm tunnel takes place between uh, Caltrans staff and also city staff. We go out there together and look at the trees and inspect them, and what we're looking for is um, identifying trees that pose a safety risk to the public. So this year, we've identified 10 trees where city staff and Caltrans staff are in agreement that these are structurally deficient enough to um, warrant removal. So the 10 trees we're showing here on the um, PowerPoint, some of them are obvious. You look at the, the tree, the two trees that I just popped in that picture, they have no leaves and it's the middle of summer and you know, obviously those trees are dead. Some of them are, um, the, the one up on the left-hand side of the screen there looks more lively, and that tree actually is hollow inside. So there's a pocket inside that um, has removed the, the true structural integrity of that tree. So these are the trees that Kelly mentioned that we're going to be put, hanging like a placard on so that people can go by and look for themselves. I know these pictures are small, but when you drive through there and you notice the ones that were actually identified, I think it'll make more sense that these trees are um, severely uh, declined. Oh, and there's the last one there. So what, um, what we are doing, we're asking feedback from city staff on what's actually working out there, the frontier of the Accolade, and you know, we'll go with the recommendation of what they feel is the best uh, Caltrans. You know, we, we feel like you really have to wait 20 years to get good information on either one of these. So um, originally when we planted the six trees back in 2013, we used bare root stock, and now um, the city is recommending going with 15 gallon trees, so we will be purchasing 15 gallon trees for the city to plant. We're also purchasing additional trees, so they will have them on hand in case one of them fails right away, they can just pull it out and replace it. Um, all of these trees are close to the roadway, which uh, generates a need for a um, advisory design exception, which Caltrans will process for the city. We've done that in the past, and we'll be updating it for this new planting. And, and that just has to do with how close the trees are to the roadway, since there is no, um, no curb or separation between traffic and these trees. So when the new trees get planted, there was previously a picture of some younger trees, but um, you know, obviously they'll be very small but we can anticipate them growing and filling in and all both of the selection of elms that we have are have that classic vase shape that we're looking for in the elm tunnel so eventually there will be a good um, fill in of canopy over the roadway and that's all I have for the presentation part do you we, we do have Brett here if anybody wants to ask questions specifically about the interaction with Shippo um, or I can talk about disease trees. <laughs> well, 
Well, let me. Uh, Should we open up? For, uh, let, let me see whether there's any public comment, uh, uh, and then we'll have you back in case there's okay. some more technical uh, uh, issues that need to be addressed. Any public comment? Suzanne Ortega. Um, I do have some questions uh, uh, for the uh, Caltrans officials. Okay. Um, but I also have a, a statement to make. Um, uh, the um, obviously the the tree tunnel has come up again as a um, hot subject. Uh, a week ago, three trees were removed without notification to the uh, community um, prior to the morning of the re their removal, and <clears throat> I under <clears throat> I have understood that it was the, um, that they were removed for the uh, Behringer driveway safety right. uh, determination. Um, three of them were removed. Uh, the community has only received information f from both the um, tree committee m meetings that were held with the uh, representative from Behringer back in 2015 and newspaper articles that state that two trees were going to be removed. So it was a surprise that three were removed um, and that Caltrans did not communicate that information to the uh, community or to the um, city uh, administration except that morning. Um, it causes uh, I guess a lot of distress in the in the town to be surprised. Um, the um, removals of the tree committee history um, is kind of lengthy, um, or at least attempts to it. Back in 1975, Governor Brown, Jerry Brown, issued an edict out of the Sacramento that all elm trees in California on state-owned property were to be cut down to eliminate the expenses incurred by the Dutch elm disease, which started to come here in California. As a result, the St. Helena mayor, Greta Erickson, took action. She, along with the community, saved the elm trees with the help of DuPont Corporation in Delaware and the University of Davis um, experts. Their treatments for the Dutch elm disease was successful since 1975. Um, I'm sure that changed over the years, but right. at least they were. The city and Caltrans, I guess, um, were participating in the, um, the inoculations. Um, the community, since 1975 that I know of, um, have been financially contributing money through um, public donations, um, sometimes going... I'm going to extend your time a little bit, okay. but I would ask you to finish up your general remarks and get to okay. the technical questions for um, Caltrans representatives. Okay. The, the community's financial con contributions and efforts have continued to the present day to preserve the trees. Um, in 2011, the community was outraged again to learn that Caltrans was going to remove 11 diseased trees. At the request of the community, Caltrans and the city held a town hall meeting out of which evolved a St. Helena Elm Tree Tunnel Management Plan and permission to replant trees, um, which was not granted before. This plan intended to facilitate communication and partnership between the state and the city to provide maintenance, preservation, and restoration of the historic elms. Um, it was approved by the State Historic Office in 2012, as far as I, the newspaper article Right. So. Can you get to the technical questions that you have for Caltrans, um, Well, I, um, let's see, I wrote it down here. Uh, I think the um, 35 or 40 trees were purchased or uh, paid for by Caltrans in 2012, I believe, and were planted in 2012. Um, they were removed in 2011 and half of them died. Um, there were two species. It seemed like it was more one species than the other. Uh, the frontier, I think, is the survivor. Um, they, 
uh, have since uh, the replanting of the original planting has been continuing and spread out over the last what uh, three or four years. Uh, there's still spots that haven't been replaced. The trees haven't been replaced, and there are spots that there's at least three or four of the original or second replantings that have died. Um, the trees came from Oregon as bare root, um, which I I would like to question why. Um, I know the arborist was um, probably not in involved at that time uh, the trees should I think the recent replantings have come from California which I think is what right. would be more successful um, so I'd like to ask the Caltrans um, people arborists to really discuss the, the replacement trees where they come from and uh, you know, um, hopefully they'll be more successful um, okay. thank you very much okay. Thank you. And oh, well, one other question. In this tree maintenance manual, or what's called St. Helena Elm Tunnel Management Plan, which was um, evolved out of that meeting in 2011, Caltrans and the city partnered with, there's um, schedules here about what Caltrans and the city is to do. Caltrans says it, it annually inspects the trees, and if they annually inspect it, why in 2000? 16, did they not see that some of the trees, the elm trees, had Dutch elm disease and removed immediately because that's really the, the best treatment for elm, um, Dutch elm disease. Okay, thank you very much. So would Caltrans like to respond to those two questions, please? Uh, first question was, why don't we source the trees in California as opposed to Oregon? And the second is, uh, does delay in uh, removing the trees after uh, Dutch elm disease has been noticed uh, um, uh, cause further problems uh, uh, if there is delay? Okay, so the first question about sourcing the bare root trees, um, there's no market for elm trees that you're going to go to a nursery and just find an elm tree. Um, so to find the trees that we wanted and target the species, we had to order them from out of state. And they come as bare root. If we want not bare root, what they do, if you go to a, like if you were to place an order with a local nursery, they'd say yes and give you a delay time because they're going to order wholesale bare root trees, plant them up, root them, and give you a rooted tree. So it has to do with the availability of trees and what you're targeting and really the lack of market here. There's not a, you're not going to find a nursery with the species that you want, the size that you want, and the health that you want. Okay. Um, so as far as removing trees, you can prevent, if you remove a tree with Dutch elm, it may prevent you from spreading that locally, right? But in this area, we have a hot spot of Dutch elm. Okay, so if I take down a tree this year that I know has Dutch elm, it's not going to save the tree next to it because this entire area has Dutch elm. It's already a hot spot. So the only way we could prevent Dutch elm from going to some other property in Napa County would be to clear cut the elm tunnel, and I don't think anybody wants that. No. But this area is a hot spot. So it, it, it would have prevented maybe something from happening 25, 30 years ago. But it's not going to help anything now because there's Dutch elm in this area. Okay. Do you have a question? I have a, a couple of questions. Um, I'm not a tree expert, but I think you mentioned you would, you were planting 15 gallon trees, which don't seem real large to me. But do you plant that size tree because it has a better chance of getting established and growing? That's what. Um, that's what's being recommended from Carlos, your city arborist, and we are accepting that recommendation. I don't know that we would actually be able to source anything larger, larger. than that. Okay. Any other technical questions of Caltrans? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Let me. Any further public comment? Yeah. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Susan Allen, 1825 Spring Mountain Court, and I was on the tree committee as a regular and then an alternative for probably 12, 15 years. It just was a long, long time. I love trees. Um, I just want to say, and this wasn't what I was prepared to say right now, but we had a very difficult time uh, with the with the elms as they as they went into decline, and in terms of of when Jim would come to the meetings every week or every month, what would we would find out is that we couldn't take we couldn't he couldn't plan a schedule that worked for him because of getting permits from Caltrans to do it at the appropriate times. So, for instance, he couldn't plant when he should have been planting. He couldn't cut suckers when he should have been cutting suckers. He couldn't um, prune when he needed to prune. So there's, there's great communication here with you, but there wasn't with the powers that needed to approve it at the time. So a lot of the deterioration, I think, for the Tunnel of the Elms was simply the communication with Caltrans and how that works, how you get permits to actually do what you needed to do. Um, and spraying, replanting, and coordination with between the city and Caltrans is really the problem that brought us here now, I think. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your long service on the tree committee, too. Uh, Mike Griffin, Park Street. Uh, I'm all for, I, you know, I'm born and raised here in the tree tunnel. I grew up with it and played in it when I was a kid and everything. But And you know, I went through it every day for 30 years working for the state. Keeping the trees going is a great thing. But the maintenance, I haven't seen maintenance. I go through it every day. I haven't seen any maintenance in that tree tunnel in years. There's more dead wood in there. The other day I drove through there. A limb fell and hit the back of my pickup. You know, I mean, it could have come through my windshield. Every day I go through, I cringe. There's one tree limb in there. It's probably four to six inches. It's been hanging there since before last winter. I don't know what's keeping it up there, but when it comes down, it's going to kill somebody. So I think they really prioritize getting some dead wood cut out of the trees, at least on the inside. The outside, it won't get down through the canopy, I don't think, but someone's going to get hurt in there. You've got a real safety issue, and I don't know what takes Caltrans so long. Uh, there's not many locals, long-time locals here, but Jimmy Hagwood used to work for Caltrans on a tree service, a one-man crew because they had no tree service left. But the, he'd come up there and spend uh, all day long cutting the suckers. He put a drip system around that, and that's the best those trees ever look with just a little loving care. And then now they just go wait and wait and wait for one to die, replace it. That's fine, but you got to do something with all this dead wood in there. It's dangerous. And I mean, now you're going to have uh, the CI kids walk through that thing. I mean, you don't know when those things are coming down there. I see them kids coming back from the school there at nighttime, and the limbs coming out of there. So someone's going to get hurt seriously, and then who holds the burden for that? I contacted my insurance carrier and asked them, what would happen if that hit my truck or broke the windshield? Tough. Act of God. I know working for the state, I turn it into the state, file a claim. That's what you get. It's never going to happen. City, they're not going to take care of my windshield, but a body, then what are you going to do when laying there with a tree limb stuck in them? So I think they need to prioritize getting the dead wood cut out of that tree immediately and all, you know, all of them through there. I mean, everybody goes through there. You could, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to look up there and look at all the dead wood. Uh, uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Griffin. Any further public comment? Let me have... Um, uh, the Caltrans representatives, uh, if they can, address the Deadwood issue, uh, maybe city staff as well. I must say that uh, it, it bothers me, too, when I drive through there to see these dead limbs up there, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I am concerned about the safety issue that Mr. Griffin raises, for sure. Did you want to speak on I'll say we've already spoken Yeah, yeah. Do you, Carlos, you welcome to come up and join in, but... Um, we have agreed, Caltrans has agreed to only prune during the winter because that's the best time when the tree is most dormant to help, um, you know, kind of not spread disease through pruning because you can spread disease through pruning. So last winter, Caltrans had 280-something storm damage projects that, um, you know, we had a very harsh winter, and right. Caltrans did not get to prune this past winter, and that's why you see so much dead wood now, because typically we would prune that out during the winter. Um, our maintenance folks are telling us they will prune this winter, 
but we will wait until winter time to get the most to, to prune the trees during the most dormant time. All right, um, Mr. Well, Mr. Irby. Good evening. Uh, just to echo what she just said, uh, we did meet with Caltrans um, maintenance tree maintenance crews out there just before storm, actually just after storms. And again, we talked about pruning on the tree trunk itself. The uh, again, city city staff takes care of anything. We call it on the ground. Caltrans are responsible for anything on the tree in Denwood. Um, and unfortunately, we had missed our window. Um, just like she stated, there is that time frame that we try to hold on to because if you do prune outside of that, you're inviting for the uh, beetles to infest it, and then well, again, counterproductive as far as when it when the when you want to prune. Um, we spoke again when we met June. Was that? Yeah. So and then they they told us they promised that we we're back on the schedule and they're going to try to do it before. Hopefully, we don't get any nasty weather again, but before um, the end of the year. Okay. Uh, I had a quick follow-up. If, if we're not going to be able to remove the trees until November, couldn't we time the tree removal and the pruning at the same time, or is it two separate modes of operations? No, we did the same time. Originally, the plan was to take down the dead trees earlier, but because of the whole process of going through SHPO and everything, we're delayed to November. So the original plan was to take down the trees in October and then prune in the winter. But now it's the window's getting closer and closer, so it may happen Sorry. at the same time. Yeah. Yes. Well, I would just like to say, you know, in dealing with the SHPO's office, what I will do is I will try to expedite that as quickly as we can through the process of, of their review. We're already um, writing our reports. We are notifying the public and the stakeholders. We're trying to get this process moving quickly. Um, if there's any anticipated, you know, issues, we would like to deal with them as soon as possible. So, if there are comments tonight, would be a good good time to put that out there. Um, our office is is committed to you know preserving the the tree row as best we can. We obviously we're dealing with a, a living entity here. Um, but we, what what will require is the the replanting. Uh, of the trees that we're removing. We're trying to maintain the integrity of the tree row, keep the canopy uh, pretty full as best we can um, by just removing the, the dead and dying trees. So just to let everyone know, we, you know, we, we are doing our best as far as the historic resources part of this we're, and maintenance uh, to, to keep the tree row there for everyone to enjoy and understanding that we're going to have gaps with smaller trees until they until they mature. So, um, but we're any any comments we're, we're we're available, and we'll try to answer those as best we can. We are are operating under Public Resources Code 5024. These are state-owned historic resource, so Caltrans is responsible for preserving them as best we can as well. It's not just uh, the city. So, we're committed to doing that. Well, I guess the question that Mr. Griffin poses is whether uh, Caltrans has taken a very recent look at some of these trees, which do have very large dead wood uh, toward the top, and uh, uh, and is relatively confident that that uh, nothing serious is going to come down until you get to it in November, December. That's that's correct, and it, I will again try to expedite i just found out about this pro this this tree removal myself uh, you know a month ago so we are we are running as fast as we can to get it get it through right. and hopefully before the rains come and winter hits okay anything further uh, kelly ms hirschberg so only thing I, I was thinking about to add to that i i know we did a couple of the uh, inspection so uh, at least at that time, you know, back in, I think it was like April and then back in June again, I think at that time it didn't really uh, show as a like, critical nature that it must be done right now. Because, you know, we, you know, we have a huge liability. So if it thinks that is that imminent that it's going to like danger public safety and stuff, we would have done it right away. So we could certainly go back and look with the city, Arborist, but um, as far as we know back from the June inspection, it, it appeared to be okay. I mean, Carlos, maybe you could. 
Because, I mean, we could have a second look, but I just wanted to... I, yeah, I would encourage a second look, because okay. uh, uh, you didn't get to the trees last winter, which is understandable given what happened to, to you uh, statewide, but uh, uh, the, the consequence is that there's been some very significant uh, deadening of the trees uh, uh, this summer there, particularly high up. That's very visible, and it's worrisome. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Okay, any further? Um, let me close the public hearing. Thank you very much, Caltrans, for your presentation. Any further council discussion with respect to this item? I, I have comments. Sure. Paul, do you want to? Well, all the comments have been excellent. Uh, one of the other comments that I would have uh, is a public safety issue. We have a Pratt Avenue bridge closed. We only have uh, two major thoroughfares through uh, this area, Silverado Trail and Highway 29. And uh, when you have a, a morning notice of trees being taken down and on 29, these three trees that we're talking about, you create a huge public safety issue with respect to emergency vehicles, ambulances, uh, other vehicles that need to get through this intersection on, on the way to a hospital or to an emergency. To me, that was a, a disaster uh, waiting to happen. I don't, you know, I, I went through there and I, I was waiting, 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 and I'm thinking to myself as I'm going to work to, in Calistoga, what if an ambulance needed to get through here right now? They couldn't cross over to Pratt. They can't get to Deer Park. They have to go all the way back to Pope. It, there's got to be better coordination and hopefully notices out to all of our emergency service providers. This is when these trees are going to be uh, taken out or pruned or maintained. These are the alternate uh, routes that we suggest. It's an absolutely critical public safety issue that needs to be uh, addressed well in advance. Okay. I'm just wondering if someone can address the issue of the number of trees that were taken down at Behringer and the discrepancy between what people thought was going to happen. Um, I guess I could probably answer partially, and I'll do my best ability of what I know. So uh, the Behringer Winery uh, group did contact us, and then what they do is, uh, since these trees are owned by Caltrans, and it's a state resource property, uh, they came through encroachment permit. So they basically any individual that who has a property adjacent to Caltrans and they want to make an improvement, like, you know, widen the driveway, add a culvert, whatever that might require, has to come through the Caltrans to receive an encroachment permit. So what we have uh, uh, thought was um, since this is the uh, sensitive and it is a historical resource and a state resource as well, uh, they need to demonstrate that they need that went out to the public and got the comments and make sure that you engage the public. So what they have done is they hired a consultant to uh, prepare the documentation that we send it to the SHPO as part of the uh, kind of the process to get approval for. So um, uh, their uh, original uh, report shows a two to four trees as far as uh, tree removal. And then uh, uh, the meeting of minds of what the safety uh, traffic engineer, because basically what you do is when you come uh, out of, and then what happened is when you don't touch anything, if it's existing condition, that's different than when you're going out there and making improvements, meaning is, uh, then you might have a even more stricter uh, requirement than as an existing condition. So when we went out there, I mean, when encroachment permit came in, and then we cannot categorically deny encroachment permit for the fairness of all public and you. So uh, when encroachment permit comes into the department, you know we have to review it, and if they meet all the uh, the check mark, meaning is, did they contact this? Have they finished this? Are they uh, prepared this and that document? Then um, th they're allowed to proceed with the encroachment permit to, to make improvements on their property or what, in this case, it would be the site distance for safety issue. And then I believe uh, it was early May. We did get some pictures from the Behringer's that there was a car accident right in front, and I could provide copy, but basically basically, what we were told is, see, this is accident waiting to happen. 
I mean, not that it was not valid, but I just wanted to share with you that they they show us some pictures of the accident that occurred in May of this year. So that came from the Behringers. So as far as the three trees of your question that you had, um, what we call is a corner size distance. So basically, as you come out of the approach, and then we have this very technical aspect of it, depending where your car is parked, and then you draw kind of the straight line to show the line of a site. Yeah, and then and that's also depending on the uh, speed of the approaching car as far as uh, how much of distance. So based on that, uh, that engineering documentation, the three tree uh, was was more in line with the speed and the the location of the driveway. All right. Any, uh, Mr. Ellsworth, you had some. Oh, do you have a? Yes, I, I just wanted to um, to respond to Mr. Doring's question as far as the the public safety and the and the. Um, public outreach. As a public information officer for Caltrans, we, we try very hard to keep you informed of everything that's going on on the highway. And it, there, there is no excuse for us to, you know, to to close a lane and back up traffic and not have any kind of publication or notification out there. For that, we regret that. Um, Caltrans is a rather large department, and we are working with our permit department. Does this happen under our permit to show up our communication? So we want to let you know that you know we sometimes I guess the analogy for me is I'm a I'm an old TV news producer is like you know kind of like being like a catcher on you know the Giants or the A's like sometimes you get thrown a curveball you you always want to be able to catch it and then relay that to your team sometimes you get thrown a curveball and, and you miss it so we regret that this one didn't turn out very well um, but we want to learn from that and move forward and. Um, I, I, I really want to meet with Erica, and, and we can talk a little bit more about showing up communication with our permit department. Um, we have been you know, act, working very actively with St. Helena for the last couple years, showing up our communication, and I think we've been successful. Uh, unfortunately, this was you know an incident that happened, um, and I want to you know reassure you that you know we're going to try harder, and we're going to work with our permit department to fix that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Uh, first of all, thank you, Caltrans folks, for coming uh, coming out. We appreciate it, and thank you, Public Works, for um, my thought on this is to take a more comprehensive uh, approach. Uh, as I mentioned on the earlier issue with the the traffic and the lights, um, the tree tunnel is a it's a Saint Helena treasure. It's a historic aspect of this town. Um, when the trees came out. I think people in town thought there was going to be a little, the, last week, the, there was going to be more discussion and certainly maybe uh, some kind of mitigations for taking them out. Who from? I don't know who, who would provide the mitigations, whether it's Behringer or who, but I know that we have private donors who want to support the tree tunnel. If there are mitigations, based on the value of the trees. And as I research the value of a tree over the course of its life, there's different calculators for this, ranging from thousands of dollars to tens of thousands of dollars for the, the value of a tree for its life in terms of its ability to sequester carbon, its ability to provide cooling. Um, so if we look at what we can do with all the stakeholders, with the city of Santa Elena, Caltrans, Behringer's there, Los Alcobas is there, CIA is, is there, Krug is just north. What if we look at this and say, hey, this, is, this could be spectacular. And if we look at, when I look at the, think about the replanting, um, thinking what are the largest trees that we could get that, that could get up to speed as quickly as possible, um, if, if we look at the pathways, the walking path on the west side, the bicycle path on the east side, would it make sense if we're going to engage in a large project to really beautify this for the entrance to our city, that we all pitch in and come up with a plan and a project manager that manages this kind of re, you know, vamping of the of the Elm Tunnel. Um, redoing the bicycle lanes, redoing the walking lane, 
integrating the traffic safety measures that we're talking about, you know, we look, look above as a comprehensive project that benefits everybody. I think all these businesses to have a beautiful entrance to St. Helena would benefit them, would benefit St. Helena. Another aspect that I, it, it's hard for me to talk about, but is since there's Dutch elm disease, is, there, is it worth looking at some other kind of tree that would be more, um, uh, 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 less vulnerable? I know that, that these elms have been here a long time, and that's, it's the elm tunnel, but I'm just, I'm just kind of trying to think outside the box if we, if we want to save the tree tunnel and have it be spectacular for all the businesses and the town, is there another kind of tree that can be implemented there? So my thought is a comprehensive project that brings in all the stakeholders and, and says, look, let's do this together. Um, and that's my thought. Well, yes. Well, I, I was going to respond to that. Or sure, go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a great idea, and what you know, we had that plan that was unfortunately not fully executed in in 2012. Uh, it it wasn't comprehensive, but uh, I think a plan that's that's been vetted that all of us can agree. The city, Caltrans, uh, State Office of Historic Preservation, any any individuals in, that are interested in it should get involved with this. So we do have a plan going forward. We, we know what's going on out there, and this is going to keep happening. And we don't want to have to go back to SHPO every year and go through this review. We'd rather have an agreement moving forward. And, uh, you know, your other point, tying it to a project can make it easier for us. So if, if there's a project that Caltrans is involved in that's near the Elm Tunnel, we can use that as a mechanism for working with SHPO and getting this plan established and getting everyone on board. So those are great ideas, and that's really where we want to go with this. Right, um, the only thing I can say, and Gene can probably say more, but as far as replacing with other, other types of trees, the Elm Tunnel is a little unique in that it is the Elm Tunnel is because of the type of tree. And, and other, other instances, we have tree rows that can be made up of a lot of different types of trees. It's not as big of an issue, but I think what's, what's really important is maintaining that canopy, that, that integrity, that you get the feeling of the tunnel. So, you know, that would just be something that we could all meet and agree on what type of trees may work there. If, if people like the, the effect, then sure, absolutely. It's not going to be a problem for us approving that. So, yeah, I agree with everything you said. Thank you. All right. Any further comments? Sounds like you have an item for the goal setting session. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right. That takes us to. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you to everybody. Yeah. Thanks for coming up. And and. Uh, uh, <coughs> So that uh, takes us to 9.4, consideration and proposed approval of resolution authorizing creation of a community engagement strategy for the planned civic needs assessment. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, and uh, I guess, uh, Mr. Presswich, this is you. I guess that concludes we, my presentation. We've much, discussed, <laughs> we've much discussed this in the past. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, a very similar presentation to the presentation that you received two weeks ago on September 12th. At that time, uh, the council subcommittee of Councilmember Doran and Councilmember Koberstein had uh, made a, a recommendation for the full council and asked for feedback from the community and the council on the concept of uh, essentially incorporating a community engagement strategy along with the planned needs assessment that's going to begin soon. That RFP, the submittals are due on October 2nd. And so the, the idea was received well at the last meeting and the staff was asked to provide a little, a little additional thinking uh, on the concept. And so tonight we're bringing you some additional feedback and recommendations. The, the committee, the subcommittee of Councilmember Koberstein and Councilmember Doring 
participated in a review of um, these recommendations in the past week. And so tonight, uh, in terms of the Citizens Committee, there was a recommendation at the last meeting to uh, come up with a maybe a, a more strategic marketing name for the committee. So we think we've done that. Um, and if you see this slide here, we're, we're referencing shape. Um, and that refers to St. Helena asset planning engagement. And when we think about the purpose of this effort, it really is to look at the shape of our future civic assets. So we felt that that was a, an acronym representative of this effort. Secondly, we gave some additional consideration to the size of the committee. And at the prior meeting, we talked about uh, the idea of a seven-member committee or a nine-member committee or possibly some alternatives. And the recommendation is to um, utilize a nine-member committee uh, with no alternatives, uh, no alternates, so that those, uh, no sorry. <laughs> And the, the idea there is that the folks that um, are volunteering for this assignment, it is a rigorous assignment. There'll be a lot of work. And um, uh, the, the hope is that those folks that are committing themselves to this effort uh, will stay engaged so that we won't need alternative um, alternates. I'm sorry, alternates for that engagement. Um, the staff report includes a, a more focused look at a tentative calendar. Um, but I've simplified that calendar because I, like um, I learned at the last meeting, not everyone has 2010 vision. And so <laughs> tonight I've, I've really summarized that in this slide that you're looking at. And if I can break this down, essentially the, the needs assessment will begin in uh, likely late October, early November. We're hoping that we can get them to come in, take a look at the assets, and produce a draft report by the end of the year. And then... Um, at this time, we're recommending that we in, that we begin the recruitment of SHAPE Citizens Committee members literally tomorrow uh, and provide a two-week period for folks to um, provide, a, provide an application to the city clerk's office. And we would essentially begin work with the SHAPE Citizens Committee between now and the end of the year that's focused on information gathering. And so if you look at the left column there, information really refers to the first phase of this process, which is there's a lot of um, education com component to this. It's a tour of city facilities. It's, a take, it's taking a look at city finances, our fees. It's uh, taking a look at the 2009 uh, visioning process. It's uh, learning more about our long-range financial forecast and receiving a briefing on the initial look at what this study looks like. Uh, we also see opportunities in that far right column for continuing public engagement. So uh, we anticipate an informational workshop uh, near the beginning of this effort. Obviously, these committee meetings would be open to the public and the community would have an opportunity to engage uh, at those meetings. And um, when we transition in the spring after the new year um, into an analysis phase, we're recommending uh, from a needs, on the needs assessment column the introduction of a potential financial advisor. We would still need to go out to an RFP and seek proposals, but the idea is to bring in someone that has uh, probably some facilitation background, real estate background, municipal finance background to help guide the work of the committee. And that work, um, that particular individual or firm could continue on after the council is presented with alternatives and be available for the council as you begin to analyze the, the recommendations that are brought forward. If you take a look at that middle column, we're anticipating that there will be a, a good month of uh, at least for the SHAPE Citizens Committee to look at the development of alternatives. So they will have learned a lot in the fall through the end of December. And in January, February, really begin to look at the development of alternatives. And once some of those are conceptually drafted or in maybe a draft stage, we see an opportunity to really, at that point, transition to the public engagement column where the community, would we would solicit volunteers that want to participate in focus groups. Um, there would be an opportunity to provide public comment in a written comment period and also an additional workshop to gather information from the community. Gather information about the alternatives that are emerging from this citizens committee. And then 
the, the community's feedback would then in turn be brought back to the citizens committee for a refinement of alternatives and so that's really an overview of the process uh, from a staffing standpoint uh, we have a individual in our public works department that we're going to um, have assigned to this project supported by uh, the public works director the finance director the city clerk and the city manager so we'll all be deeply involved in this effort um, and we're hoping that this process can uh, conclude by about the second week of April if we uh, are able to adhere to what is a, an aggressive timeline okay and with that I'll pause and answer any questions you have all right, let me open it up for public hearing. Any public comment at this point? I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion to approve the uh, recommendation. So moved. <laughs> Second. I, I already did that. Ms. Black? Second, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Ellsworth. Vice Mayor White? Yes. Council Member Ellsworth? Yes. Coverstein? Yes. Doring? Yes. Mayor Galbraith? Yes. Okay. Uh, next item is uh, the uh, discussion of the Municipal Service Review and Sphere of Influence update. And uh, uh, not seeing Mr. Housh, I'll turn to Mr. Prestwich. I'll substitute for Mr. Housh tonight. Uh, this item is a work in progress. It's a collection of initial feedback that we've collected from a couple of council members and also staff. And in taking a look at the, the nature of these comments, it's our recommendation that the council uh, consider requesting the Napa LAFCO postpone their planned discussion on October 2nd on the city's municipal service review and sphere of influence update. We think there are too many items that need updating um, before they can have an informed conversation about the city's municipal services as well as the sphere of influence. And so what we would recommend is that we contact uh, Napa LAFCO, send them a letter, uh, and request that that be postponed to a later date until we have, we in the community have a document that's a, a bit more seasoned for review. Um, we will continue to inventory these items and uh, capture comments if, if the community or the council have additional comments and then our intent is to communicate those to, to Napa LAFCO. Their submittal deadline for comments is October 13th, so we have one more opportunity to bring this back to the council um, at uh, the meeting of October 12th. <coughs> So I'll pause there and answer any questions you have. Well, I strongly support the staff recommendation. Mr. Doring last time said that uh, the uh, document was not up to prime time. I thought he, I thought he hit it right on the nose, uh, and uh, I strongly support your recommendation. Yeah, I would agree with that. And are we going to have a representative at the October second meeting? It's on a couple of our calendars. Yes. Okay. Great. If we get this extension, does that October deadline still hold for getting our comments in? It doesn't seem to make a lot of seems sense. seems like we'd want to ask for a, an extension on that. It, it, mm -hmm. it does hold for now, but I think it's it would be appropriate for us to also request an extension of the public comment period uh, at a point where we have a revised draft that we can look at and the community can look at. I mean, I see a lot of technical... Um, changes that need to be made uh, the one part that's missing is is sort of our policy decision uh, with respect to certain uh, potential expansions of sphere of influence I mean we have to have a policy dis a discussion at the council level uh, for example you know the Meadowood issue uh, the South 29 corridor the, these issues one of the notions that I or one of the thoughts I had in, in, in looking at the current version of the SOI was it was just too too broad there's just you know but that we we would as a council look at potentially looking at certain areas at least at study areas or something less than asking for a, a potential sphere of influence change something that's less than that maybe to get us primed for the next five-year review and so that that seems to be missing from this and maybe there uh, the manager can talk more about that process can I make one comment uh, also that uh, 
<clears throat> I think it would be important to um, have have those policy issues um, talked about, uh, especially in the light of the septic systems and things that are to to our south mostly um, in some of the subdivisions, but also um, ask LAFCO for the possibility of a of another uh, service review in maybe four years when we have our general plan um, completed, uh, giving four years maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully in two years. But, <laughs> but at, and in that time, we actually um, take a look at what the potentials are, especially with tertiary um, uh, for our sewage treatment plant and how we could tie in that to uh, some of the issues around in, in the study areas. So, well, I, I think just com general comments on the process. This is a this is a document that hasn't been updated since I believe two thousand mm -hmm. eight, and so these don't come around very often. And at this point in time, the current schedule calls for LAFCO to make a decision a final decision on the MSR and the SOI on December 2nd, I believe, or December 4th, in early December, um, December 2nd. So I recognize that the, the council hasn't had a chance for a policy discussion on ideas related or issues related to septic or issues related to the sphere of influence. And because this, because LAFCO controls the timing on this, uh, it may be appropriate for us to have at least an initial policy discussion uh, on October 12th in case there's not a an extension of the public comment period so that we can at least capture a few concepts. So I think if I can generalize, we would be concerned about septic and 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 the lack of connections uh, if if we had capacity for example uh, at the wastewater treatment plant we would encourage uh, connections to sanitary sewer as opposed to ongoing septic reliance and in terms of the sphere of influence there may be opportunities for just as I think this document uh, illustrates there may be some study areas that they've floated as possible um, areas of the a, of the city to consider a, an expansion of the sphere of influence we really don't have a sphere of influence today right. it, it aligns with our border and uh, that's just representative of this uh, a number of communities in this county but uh, there are some valid reasons why uh, the I think the Napa Lafco is um, looking at a couple of these study areas and so um, what we can do is gener provide some general statements that we might want to um, have you review, just in, an, in a preliminary discussion. And if there's a if there's an extension granted, and it may not be granted until the meeting of October second, so we won't know maybe until October second when they would take action. But um, we would be able to report back to you on October twelfth. That works. Yeah, October second is coming up pretty fast. Coming up very quickly. <laughs> yeah, all of that makes sense to me. I think in develop, I agree with everything you said, um, Mark. I think it would uh, be important and prudent to have another conversation with the uh, LAFCO executive director to try to sort of bounce off some ideas. It looks like we, I would recommend that we retreat from this huge, expansive uh, study area, all these different study areas, and kind of maybe formulate in our minds what do we want studied. And I think it would be important. I don't know if. Uh, Mr. Friedman would share uh, with you, but he, he is an expert, and we should sort of sort of bounce off some of the ideas that you may have going forward to see if, you know, are they going to be dead on arrival, or do they have a chance of even uh, being accepted by the LAFCO uh, committee? And I think what we could do on, on, on October 12th is itemize the four for you to have a, to provide uh, the staff with some feedback on you know the Meadowwood area south of town, and just be able to note that so we can communicate that that policy preference to the Napa Lafco right. Commission. Okay, uh, that got us where we need to be tonight. I think. Okay. Uh, any public comment? Close public comment. Let's 
go to. No, uh, we have the standing items, but I'm, I'm not sure there's anything to be said at this point uh, with respect to Adams Street or the wastewater treatment plant. There's nothing. But in terms of Adams, it may be appropriate to postpone these uh, updates until the conclusion of the needs assessment process. I think that's true, yeah. Okay. And then just on the wastewater, is everything moving along? Uh it's it's moving along. We got um, we got we've gotten approval from our, our last letter from the, to the state on our schedule. Of course, Great. they took out their response times. We, we wanted them to give us feedback in the appropriate times, but they they're honoring our, our current schedule we submitted. So, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, meeting stands adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.